actually doing this. Where are we climbing? You got someone right behind you. That was that's me. What, what mountain is that? That one uh, was uh, the Grand Teton. But if you want to know, this is where this is where I'm really at, dude. <laughs> <laughs> This is what I had. I, I had this on another Zoom call and no one commented. Nice. <laughs> Should I do that one? Wi Fi was true. That's a better do that, one. Do that. Arsham, do that. It I'll, looks like you're the owner, though. There's I'll nobody leave it. there. No, it's, I, I found one without anyone there because then people would get offended if I had like a stripper actually there. But this is the COVID. But you can guy. have Ike there with you. Yeah. <laughs> That's I good. love it. <laughs> I'm gonna leave it up then. We need the music though. Don't you know what I know? <laughs> I could play it for my thing, man. <laughs> oh man, that'd be distracting. So we have uh, we have people entering our uh, our webinar. Just uh, open the doors here, and uh, <coughs> just uh, we're all we're all actually with our sham. We all have virtual backgrounds. Our sham's got the real background. <laughs> Uh, so those of you that are just joining us, uh, let us know where you're from. Uh, use the chat uh, or the QA box. Just tell us where you're from. We have panelists from Canada and the U.S. here and Venezuela representing. Uh, so we're going to get started shortly. Just want to make sure everyone gets a chance to get in. As you know, with Zoom, we're also live on, on YouTube as well. Everybody who's watching on YouTube, welcome to uh, our Prism Rounds. And we've got folks from from South Africa, Istanbul, Israel, Mexico, uh, Mississauga, right on. Wow, really far. Really far. Uh, Italy, Sweden, fantastic. From South Brazil, Garth, Garth's a regular from Maine. Good to see you, Garth. Some Montreal folks there joining you there, Dima. Yeah. Fantastic. So we're going we're gonna to get started here. Just uh, want to give everyone a chance to get in. Thank you all for joining us on, on, a, on a bright Saturday morning here in Mississauga. Hopefully, wherever you are, it's, uh, it's, it's bright and sunny, and hopefully it's uh, safe for you, of course, as well, and you're, you're staying home. These, uh, these rounds have been going on for a month now. It's been basically a month for us that we've been on, on essentially lockdown. So uh, for most of us, this is our contact with the outside world, other than, of course, having to see urgent patients. Uh, these have been run uh, now on a Wednesdays and Saturdays, and we thank all the presenters for being involved. We have two uh, presentations today, and uh, I want to ask uh, Jeb maybe to just share some of his slides to get started, and, and thank everyone for joining us. These have been really great to, uh, to get a discussion going. Uh, our first case, I think, will be highly interactive. Um, again, I'm just looking at all the, all, the, all the people joining in here, and we've got great uh, representation around the world. Uh, Ravi has arrived. Ravi, Ravi uh, Gold from uh, from the U.S. protecting sites, so we means we can start. And we've got uh, a wide range of folks from around the world. So, Jeb, if you want to take it from here, sounds good. So, welcome again, everybody, and thanks for uh, joining us on this beautiful Saturday. Uh, most of you already know, but our website is www.prisminstitute.com/webinars. Uh, for any emails. Um, send it to ike.webinars at prismi.ca. Uh, we're, we're always very appreciative of any type of feedback. We've actually changed our rounds to doing only two presentations instead of three, because we were starting to find it kind of challenging just to stay within the time frame allotted. So we're always trying to figure out how we can make it better for uh, everyone uh, involved. Uh, just a brief reminder in terms of the types of presentations we're looking for, whether it's a lecture, a case, or an article that you want to review, again, send those out to our email address. Always happy to hear from you guys. Our uh, website is fully operational, so you can access previously recorded webinars. You can also register for future webinars, so um, make sure to take full advantage of that. So this coming Wednesday, that's April 22nd at 3 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to have Dr. Tiziana uh, DeFrancesco, who's going to be presenting pigment dispersion glaucoma, beware. And we also have uh, Dr. Ahmed, who's going to be presenting uh, how to stay sharp out of the OR during COVID-19. I think it's going to be particularly relevant to a lot of us. Um, there's going to be some great ideas here, so you don't want to miss that. Our first presenter today is Dr. Nir Shoham Hazan, who's a glaucoma, cataract, and advanced anterior segment surgeon in uh, Miramichi, New Brunswick, in uh, Canada. Uh, he voluntarily did a three-year fellowship with Dr. Ike Ahmed, and he did his ophthalmology residency at the Kaplan Medical Center in uh, Israel. We also have Dr. Dima Kalash on this panel, who's a glaucoma, cataract, and advanced anterior segment surgeon in uh, Laval, Quebec. She also did a GAS fellowship with, uh, with Ike before and she did her residency at McGill University. 
we have Dr. Vanessa Vera, who's a surgical consultant who I'm pretty sure a lot of you already know. Uh, she's an adjunct professor at the Unidad Ophthalmologica de Caracas, and she also did a fellowship with, uh, with Ike Ahmed before. Our second speaker is Dr. Ike Ahmed himself, a Division Head of Ophthalmology at Children Health Partners here in Mississauga, Director of the GAS Fellowship and Assistant Professor at the University of Toronto. On this panel, we have Dr. George Durr, aka the Durr Effect. He's a glaucoma, cataract, and advanced interior segment surgeon at uh, SHIM in Montreal. Uh, he's the glaucoma fellowship director there, and he did a GAS fellowship as well, and he did his residency at the University of Montreal. And last but not least, we have Dr. Arsham Shibani, who's an assistant professor of ophthalmology and visual sciences at Washington University uh, School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. He's the director of advanced interior segment and glaucoma surgery fellowship there, and he also did a GAS fellowship with Dr. Ike Ahmed. So we have a, a bit of a reunion here. So this should be pretty fun. I'm gonna give it back to Ike, who has a few words for everybody here. Hey, thanks, Jeb. And we'll just get uh, near to get the slides up and ready. So thank you everybody for joining. I see again, we've got a, we got a good sized group and we have um, folks from around the world. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Uh, these have been trying times. Uh, I think for many of you, I hope uh, the uh, pandemic and the crisis is plat plateauing. Um, but it, of course, uh, there's still a number of hotspots in the world and we, we pray for, for folks to be safe. Um, if you're having any trouble joining on Zoom, you, you're welcome to join us uh, on YouTube. Maybe Jeb, if you can write the link on the uh, on the chat. Um, there are uh, a number of folks on YouTube as well, and sometimes the videos are are a little easier to see on YouTube uh, compared to Zoom. So uh, near uh, near, thank you for joining us. Near's um, been very active, of course, in uh, in our in our glaucoma and entry segment world, both in Israel and in Canada, and he runs uh, the MIGS course at uh, ASDRS. Uh, Nir, uh, thanks for uh, joining us and we look forward to hearing your case and we'll, we'll hopefully take some time to pause and, and ask questions and, and probe a little bit on your case. Wonderful. So thanks very much, Ike. Thank you for including me in, in your um, sessions. Uh, I decided to call my talk proactive or reactive. And um, basically, this is kind of a shout back toward um, fellowship and when I began being part of the GAS family, <laughs> part of the glaucoma and advanced interior segment. So we have 2010 here, Vanessa's here, Devish, um, and 2019. So basically been in the family for about uh, 10 years and that's kind of the family that we choose. So we're pretty lucky. And Ike, we know, has always been kind of ahead of his time. So that's him in 2010 with his PPEs utilizing my favorite pink color. So thanks, Ike. Um, what I hope to achieve um, today is kind of, kind of a crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing is used increasingly in health and medical research, and it's the process of aggregating crowd wisdom to solve a problem. Typically, they're diagnostic dilemmas. Mine today will be disease staging dilemma, but more so a therapeutic interventional um, dilemma. Um, if you are not familiar with diagnosis um, series on Netflix, I urge you to see Dr. Lisa Sanders. She is a contributor. She's a GP and a writer for the New York Times. So now I think all of us have some, some time to do that. I urge you to see um, her series. So I'm going to start with presenting my case. Um, I named uh, the patient Dr. MD, who is a prominent physician in our community. He's 61 years old and he's a white male who's been followed for glaucoma or ocular hypertension since 2005, onwards perhaps getting uh, open angle glaucoma or mixed mechanism glaucoma. T maxes were in the upper 20s on average the CCTs. His past ocular history is positive for trabeculoplasties, had ALTs done, SLTs done, and more recently, laser peripheral iridotomies. Currently on a Zarga and Alphagan with some allergy or reaction to prostaglandin analogs. Uh, past medical history, so he's a hypertensive on ACE inhibitors and thiazide diuretics, has some uh, hypercholesterolemia. Even though, or despite that, he's a pretty good curler and a sweeper, so he, he curls with us on when COVID is off. So he was referred to me um, to take over his care with a question of intervention or surgery. So this is the paper charts back in the day. In 2002, he, 2005, sorry, presented 
with IOPs untreated in the high 20s, 29. And at that time, Zalatan prostaglandin analog was started. A few months later, a good response to that. Uh, two years later, uh, developed again, elevating or increasing intraocular pressure. Vision has been good. This is uncorrected and already noted some pretty advanced cupping. So again, we're talking about 2007. At this point, the physician decided to uh, change his medication um, to a beta blocker. Earlier on um, in his disease state, 2007, he had a visual field, which was a swap. It was a blue on yellow. And if we look at the pattern standard deviation or pattern deviation, um, there isn't too much um, to, to note, maybe some early central um, defects, but we'll go on. We have a lot of um, slides and diagnostics to look at. So here we've got Humphrey, CETA fast 2005 all the way to 2006. And here it's noted in the chart, maybe some inferior nasal changes, uh, maybe an arc, but not, not, so, not so significant. Left eye is doing pretty well. Uh, 2009, we have um, an, our first OCT, and what we can see is pretty thin retinal nerve fiber layer. The average thickness is pretty thin, and we can depict also pretty advanced cupping, which is kind of what has been uh, noted on the paper charts. Looking at the GPA of the Zeiss of the Sears at the time, what we can see, I'll start with the right eye. So one of the baseline scans was really off. So uh, neglected to use that, but overall GPA uh, seems to be pretty um, stable average cup to disc ratio. This uh, scan in 2017, maybe slightly lower signal strength and some artifacts. So maybe here there was noted to be some possible loss or change. Same if we look at the left eye all the way from 2009 to 2017, there is maybe some change again, low signal strength. So um, nothing to hang our hat on. I joined um, this practice in 2017 and um, got this patient all to myself. Um, so we know the past medical or ocular history has had trabeculoplasty, was on three drop classes, pretty good uncorrected vision. <clears throat> His IOPs are always measured in the morning. He's a physician in our uh, community. So he comes typically just before he starts his practice. And this raises the question, do we need a urinal um, IOP um, pressure curve? And what I noted is that he had a pretty moderate anterior chamber, not deep by no means. Angonio uh, Schaefer grade one, 360, and some lens rise in both eyes. And trying to implement what I learned in fellowship, I said, okay, we need some anterior segment imaging, either a UVM or anterior segment OCT. And I considered a uh, sequential laser peripheral iridotomy because he was on drops, because pressures were, seemed to be unstable. Instead of doing simultaneous and getting an IOP spike, I decided to consider a sequential um, LPI. And when I checked his fundus, so again, pretty significant cupping, but looking back at 2005, it was not a huge change. And at this time I was also thinking, is this, ocular hypertension, are we talking about open angle, or perhaps now it's a mixed angle or mixed mechanism with narrower angle closure. So at that time in the hospital, we had um, the Zeiss, the Cirrus, and uh, we did a anterior segment OCT, but only in quadrants, right and left eye. And what seemed to correlate to my clinical exam, the angles were pretty narrow in my opinion. And so he had a uh, laser peripheral iridotomy one week apart with no can you, IOP. Can I, can I stop you for a second? Yes. I'm just gonna stop you for a second. I'm, and I'm just gonna maybe just open it up and the, ask the panelists just uh, what their thoughts were about you know, you know, your management so far, just to kind of uh, give some color to it and, uh, and, some, and some thoughts. If you go back to the pre, okay, you got the pre LPI here. So what are your thoughts here? I mean, folks, you have this gentleman here who's been followed for, for many years, I guess almost 15 years, uh, and has uh, basically, a, looks like they've got 
you know, RNFL loss and copying. They've had ALT and SLT. They've had LPI in the before too as well, or no? That that was not a previous LPI before, was yeah. it? Before, no. So they, no, this right. image is actually and, pre. Uh, okay, yeah. So, but but they came to you. They came to you without a PI. So, what are your thoughts so far, everybody? What are you What are you thinking here? Um, I mean, pressures pressures are you said between fifteen to to, to twenty or so. And the T max was about 30 high teens. Yeah. So, so what are your thoughts? We'll get, maybe start with Dima and, and Vanessa. Again, feel free to disagree. Feel free to just say, I think it's perfect near the tough guy. Dima, I'm mute yourself there, Dima. I'll unmute you there. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I, I agree with, uh, with um, what Nir has looked at. For sure, we don't want to see is this angle closure or, or not. Um, Nir had noted that it was uh, quite closed. Now, the question is, he's, his cupping is 0.9. So as Nir said, there would be a high risk of having some spikes and, and worrying about that. So this is the debate of whether we should go ahead and do a lens extraction in this case versus uh, just a PI. Um, now, now, the only thing is, is there's sometimes, I know I, I, we've discussed this many times, is this angle closure or narrow angles? Because there has to be kind of a, you know, difference between the two. Because if it's narrow angles, then a lot of times, if it's like an open angle one, you kind of treat it more as an open angle. But if it's actually closed, then you would treat it more as a closed angle. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the, what a, a good gonio, and you have some good OCT and intersegment OCTs would be very helpful in this case. And I think, like, um, I don't know, Nir, if, if you can, Sometimes it's very hard for, for people to get the uh, intersegment OCT where these scleral spurs. So um, I think we can show that to the audience, I guess, um, just to show where the scleral spur is and, and be able to say that, yes, these are narrow angles. And um, I think in this case, I tend to go for LPI despite, I know the, the Eagle study, depending on whether the patients are very advanced or not and the pressure, the IOP that they have. So this IOP was around 18. So there's no harm in, I think, trying it. Um, to get you kind of uh, a little bit more um, uh, leeway. But you did notice that they had lens rise. And so in these cases, even if they're angle closer, I do tend to think if, it, if they are more lens rise, I do tend to think that I, I go a little bit more for lens extraction in these cases. And then in, in which case I would have performed as well a mixed procedure, but we can go further that, into that afterwards. I wanna add right. my thoughts. So in my, my view, first of all, uh, I'm very happy that this patient has been very well documented. So it's very impressive that we have a lot of history for the past 10 years or so when you get the patient. We have all these visual fields, we have his Tmax, we have the medication. So all of that kind of puts us at ease that it's not a rapid progressive patient. There's no rush here. We have information. We can take our time to understand exactly what's happening and what's the best next step for this patient, which is exactly what you're doing. So I agree with your, let's, let's bring more testing. Let's try to understand what's happening in the Langle. Is it uh, less rise? Is 18, is it a high IOP where he's progressing or is that good enough for him? So trying to understand where he is at right now and if it's something really necessary versus a potential risk, I think I, I agree with his management. All right, uh, George uh, Arsham. Yeah, I'll play, I'll play devil's advocate. Maybe this was never open angle. Maybe it was closed the whole time and they've been SLTing the Schwabies line for, uh, and ALTing the, uh, the Schwabies line. So um, this is uh, quite commonly missed angle closure. I'm not saying they did, maybe they're excellent in the, and they had an open angle mechanism and then the cataract progressed and it closed the angles. But um, you have to always uh, kind of hold that in the back of your mind that it could be maybe some angle closure uh, from from the get go, uh, I'm, so I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious. And Arsham, I mean, are you are you convinced this is angle closure? Uh, you know, so these, uh, to be honest, these OCTs I don't like. Uh, once you get to angles that are tight, they tend to break down where you need to view them, um, especially on the color mapping. Not, I'm not dogging anything that you're putting up there near. I just I I have trouble interpreting exactly where uh, Schlem's and TM is, but. So in general, um, a couple of pearls I want to talk about. If you have a patient that's a near emetrope and 
they might be progressing at normal pressures or if they have kind of asymmetric glaucoma at normal pressures and they're near emetropic or maybe slightly hyperopic, start really thinking about, um, about angle closure. On the OCT scan, I try to find a couple of anatomic markers where um, I can kind of identify Schlems. Here, it's pretty tough for me to identify. Like you have a dropout on that left side. Uh, I'll probably have to defer to your gonio a little bit. You said it was grade one for 360. But but Arsham, before you go there though, don't don't you, I just want to just point out something here. If you look at the um, if you look at the um, this where, where the images are taken, look, you see how yeah. you see how the the scans we were taking like they were not yeah. perpendicular to the angle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's looking yeah. like kind of the left down and down and right. Yeah. So I'm not I sure if I would really is. look at this image. I know, I know. I, I agree. The quality is not great. Um, sadly, they were not done by me, which is probably another issue. And for now, um, this is not our uh, standard but here, and we'll see what happens. The, in my mind, the main question is, is this glaucoma, yes or no? And if it's glaucoma, mm -hmm. and now we have glaucomatous optic neuropathy, and we think it's angle closure, that really shifts the discussion, and we have evidence to guide us there. I mean, if the pressure was ever over 30, even without optic neuropathy, or if the pressure was, you know, over 21 now requiring treatment with some type of optic neuropathy, which it looks like this patient has, to me, clear lens extraction is, is where I would, I would go. And I, I'm going to defer more to your gonio. And if you're thinking that they're kind of zero to, to one grading, and you assume that some of those ones might turn into a zero when they're not at your slit lamp, um, I, would, I would prefer to go to the lensectomy route. And would you do a lensectomy if he's already kind of upper teens with three drops or would you do lensectomy plus something? Yeah, I mean, like the, the patients in, that, in the Eagle study randomizing LPI to lensectomy were over 50 years old without significant uh, symptoms from their cataract. So essentially clear lenses. But if their pressure was over 21 with some type of optic neuropathy and then required some treatment, um, that you know, we, we know that they do better in the long term with lensectomy over LPI. So I, I'll just I jump in and I, I'm going to pick up an advocate back. here. Yeah, go I, ahead, Vanessa. I, wait, wait. I, I want to I ask George because he brought an interesting point, which I kind of disagree. So George, let's say this was originally maybe a close angle patient. After several SLTs and ALTs, wouldn't we have some scatter PAS at this point or something that will tell us they were lasering the wrong place and creating some inflammation and some PAS? Wouldn't you think so? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It's hard to, it's hard to know. Like sometimes these patients have had like six SLTs and you have nothing. The angle looks completely, uh, completely normal. Sometimes you'll get the and PAS. And it was a closed angle. Yeah. 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 And, and I, it doesn't always have to have the PAS. If you look on that left eye, I mean, again, like the scan's not great, but I almost wonder if there is PAS or it's just true apposition, right? Exactly, right where you're showing there. Um, so, but I, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna argue. I don't think you can. I don't think you can. I mean, that's basically look. You're looking at. You're looking at the eye on a tangent. Uh, no, I agree. That's why I said initially, I'd like the scan not yeah, you great can't, to analyze. You, I, I'm going to caution anybody to evaluate that eye without taking a cross section that's vertical or perpendicular to the limbus. Otherwise, you're essentially getting, you're basically coming up, you know, at, at a tangential angle. So I, I would be worried about using this. I think you're right. I, I think it depends on your exam. I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit and say more than even George. I'm going to say, listen, this guy's pressures were 30, 15, 15 years ago. He's been medicated and he's been lasered a couple of times. He's been stable as far as I know. Mm -hmm. His visual fields are look normal to me. They look pretty good to me. Uh, his OCTs are not great, but there's no evidence of progression that I can see. His angles, well, I'll, I'll argue with you. I'm not sure what a grade one means, but I didn't hear that he's got appositional closure where you cannot see the TM. The TM oh, is visualized yeah. in this patient. So um, he's not progressing. The angles are not closed. I, you know, everyone knows I hate when people use the word narrow angle glaucoma. I think it's a terrible term. What does that mean? Either you're open or you're closed, period. If you believe that this person is intermittently getting spikes, that's fine. Whether it's by open mechanisms or angle closure mechanism, that's fine. 
But sitting here right now, to me, this, this is not angle closure. Is he at risk for getting angle closure? Yes, perhaps, either over 10 years, maybe, or if he's getting spikes, if you believe he's getting spikes. But uh, I, I don't know. To me, I'll be pretty harsh here. I don't think there's any reason to do anything in this patient. I'm not convinced of it at all. And in fact, doing something, if he indeed does have an open mechanism and do a PI, could tip him over. PIs have some risk as well, and PIs don't work great anyways. So uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to take that position <laughs> just to be well, this is, this is what I said. Like you, you have to start with, are you diagnosing it as glaucoma or not? Does he have glaucoma? Is it progressing or not? But if he has glaucoma, even without progression, though, I, I would argue if you think the angle is closed, then he would need lensectomy by definition. He's, he's closed, but, but we haven't heard that, closed. though, Arshan. We haven't heard he's closed. Yeah. No, I, I agree. He's, I agree. Okay. So I, I didn't go ahead and couple, do it because I, I wanted to be, and, and again, Eagle study, I, I want to say least invasive, but we know that a lensectomy would have been safer than an iridotomy. Mm -hmm. Um, and but just before you go there, near just just be careful. Before you see eagle study, this is not an eagle study patient. Absolutely not. I know. Right? I know. No, no, no. And and, I, and, so, and somebody wrote that Schaefer one is a is is obvious diagnosis of occludable angle. Um, well, what does that mean? Occludable angle over what? Over a longer period of time, possibly. But even then, I mean, then we have to go back and look at, for example, uh, the you know the ZAP study, where you have people who are not grade zero, grade one. They were like closed. And and they did they did not particularly have a big chance big problem in terms of occludability in terms of IOP or glaucoma, again different patient population. But I would just be really cautious unless like I think as we've all said I mean if we believe this patient's pressure is high because his angle is closed closed not narrow closed, then that would uh, result in me acting into opening his angle by some method. Okay. So I, I hear everyone, and I actually um, did go ahead and do an, an iridotomy. Um, and basically what we see here is that if we can try and compare to the previous scans, uh, we do see that the, um, there is more, from what I, I remember and seeing, is that there's a more uh, flat contour, no pupil block, and the angles do seem somewhat uh, more open to me. Um, one can just can, can uh, consider maybe do we have any low insertion, iris insertion of plateau, but that I, I'm going to try and, and move on if, if it's okay. Well, by this, okay. This, can I, can I ask about what you're telling? Well, let me, let me just mention one thing. Um, it, it would be rare in my mind to see an LPI get an angle open to this degree. Um, and so, like, to me, this is a little bit more telling. I mean, you'd have to have pretty significant pupil block for that to have been closure before. So I, I, do, I do agree with that. Um, you know, and, and just especially if you look over on that, uh, that left side, it's, uh, it's fairly open there. You know, the bottom, the bottom scan, again, is it's, it's a little off center. But, um, yeah, it, it'd be surprising for an LPI to get it that open. Unless the pupil block was massive. So, so let me just. Yeah, I completely on that agree. Well. That's, uh, I completely agree that George. I don't, I, yeah, I, don't yeah, I was going to say I, I agree. I, I agree with Arsham there. I think th those are pretty. Those are pretty open. The iris insertion is pretty flat. Like the, if you look at the iris itself, it's it's pretty flat. There's no like elevation in the in the corner there to say that maybe it's a little bit of plateau. If you look, I, I'm. You can't maybe see my cursor there, but we can see scleral spur quite well, like where there's that kind of little bump in the corner. So on the other side, actually, yeah, exactly, right there. I don't know who who, who did that, but that's 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 pretty much where scleral spur is. Uh, th there's, I mean, if there was some pupil block, and the LPI helped with that, then the iris would be bowed a little bit more before, and it's possible that there was significant pupil block before, and then then this afterwards came down, but I would call that more unlikely than, than, uh, than what we see here. Okay. Um, um, I'm, I, I'll move on. So um, we're up to 2019, April 2019. I do have an FDT. And for patients that either don't perform um, 
a standard automated parametry pretty well. I do do um, FDTs as well. Sometimes it's shorter, sometimes they like it better. And if we look at the right eye, not much to, to write home about, maybe a questionable paracentral um, changes here, but I've done a few and we're gonna, we're gonna be able to see them. Uh, this is uh, uh, six or four months later again. So the changes that we had on the left disappeared. Now, all of a sudden we have maybe a superior um, arc here. Um, and I've seen them last before all COVID started. Um, vision, corrected vision is 2020. And I kind of try and check every possible machine um, in uh, checking his IOP. So I do NCT, I do eye care, of course I do Goldman. Um, and again, around the right eye, which is potentially better around 16 and 18 on the left. And when I look at his nerves and he, he always says that, that any ophthalmologist that looked in on his nerves went wow. So his nerves, and we'll see shortly, are pretty, pretty cupped. So we can see the, the fundus photos in both in both eyes. Um, it, it's, it is a pretty cupped nerve and um, it's same reaction and every everyone that sees him says the same thing. So this is December, 2019. If it's look actually a pretty good photo near where, like I'm looking for these uh, areas of RNFL dropout. Um, so definitely, it, it, you can see bunch yeah, of defects exactly. here. Yeah, yeah. And, and then on the here. other side, yeah, there yeah. you go. Uh -huh. Here, yeah, so it, it, it is, it comes from the compass fundus photos and it, it is pretty remarkable. Sometimes I prefer seeing this over the patient itself, uh, but you can see the, the RNFL defects pretty clearly. Um, and if we look again at a visual field, um, again, pretty normal feel. I don't know if this is potentially a beginning of a nasal step on the left. Um, right eye is, is pretty, pretty good and normal. And after that, just recently repeated an FDT. And again, he doesn't love doing his fields. The global, indice, the global indices are, yeah, maybe do say that there is some uh, out of normal uh, range, but all in all, I, I couldn't um, make a parametric um, diagnosis here. When have we look at the- 10-2, sorry, Nir, have you done a 10-2 for this patient? Because if you look at the pattern deviation, there are some some central losses there. And I'm just wondering exactly. if you've done, not, not, not in the FDT, but the, um, the compass. Right, so um, that that's the plan. That's the plan for okay. next time. To, to do um, a 10 2. I, I agree. Okay. I agree. Because that would change, even uh, if the pressure is 18, and, and like, you know, if I, I, you know, I was saying, may not treat, but that would change. Now he's advanced, right? And the pressure of 18 would be high, higher than you'd want. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So, and that's a very good point. And because he has, and it's not a good enough excuse, but because he doesn't do fields very well, a 10 2 will be longer, will take more time, and might confuse him and me, but that's definitely. Um, the next step. I, I absolutely agree. When we look at the OCT, so now it's a different OCT. It's, it's a top con. We do have a very thin RNFL and the vertical cup to disc ratio kind of shows us again, um, advanced cupping for, for the right eye. This is April, 2018. And then we have the left eye, which is almost the same. So very advanced cupping and very thin um, RNFL. If we look at the Hood report, which helps us to correlate the um, um, OCT on uh, visual field test points, again, we see a pretty remarkable picture here, which doesn't correlate to what we see yet on the visual field. Same goes for the left eye. And if I look at the trend analysis for his RNFL, um, it, it looks, although this is just from 2018 um, until now, it, it looks rather, um, the slope is rather stable or rather flat. This test, I think there's lots of ar artifacts here. So the last one I cannot, I have to disregard, um, as well as for his ganglion cell layer, ganglion cell complex. And this brings me to um, one of my first dilemmas. How do I classify him? If I look at the CGS, the, Can the Canadian glaucoma guidelines, is he advanced because of advanced glaucomatous uh, cupping 
based on that as alone. Or if I look at the uh, PPP um, of the AAO, is he mild? Because yes, there's RNFL um, cupping, but questionable normal field here. So if he's advanced, naturally we are above our target. If he's mild, maybe we are, are that we are on target IOP. Here, you, so you, that, said, you said they had mentioned his discs uh, looked abnormal before. I mean, how long ago was that? If he was like in his 30s, this could be physiologic cupping and not glaucoma. True. So we don't know how far before. So we, we have documentation as for him as well since around 2000 or 2005. So I, I do agree with you. I do agree that it could be physiologic, but... Would Any I, family members near that you can take a quick pick? There's no family history of, of glaucoma that we know. No, of. not glaucoma, like like big, big this, big okay, cupping. Think, there's no, no, we don't know of any. I mean, the one thing, like your T-Max at least steers you more toward, there is probably some pressure mediated change. You can start assuming that a little bit more, but it's um, it, just by looking at the, the clinical history with like the disc, the OCTs and the field, I, I wouldn't classify it as an advanced. I don't know what the other guys think. Well, you're on the, on the other side of the border, right? That, that, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I just I just saw I just saw, I just saw that Stan Jay Sarani just uh, just made a comment here. I'm gonna actually get get him to kind of uh, pick up uh, make a couple comments here. So Stan Jay, I'm just gonna bring you in here if you're still there. Maybe go back to the OCT near because I think Stan Jay wanted to make some comments on the OCT, which I was also interested in talking about. Okay, Stan Jay, are you there, buddy? Yes. Can you hear me? Hey, Stan Jay. Thank you. Thanks for joining hey, us. Sure. Sure, so if you look at this OCT, um, I'm gonna try and use my um, annotating. Or... Just a second. Uh, this area here is the only abnormality. You can see the rest of the nerve fiber layer all around is completely normal. And if you look at the other eye also, if you go to the other eye, please, near. thank you. You can see this is the only abnormality here. The rest of the RNFL is completely normal. So this does classify as possibly a mild glaucoma stage only because the visual field is normal. I would implore you to ignore comparison to a normative database. You, this is not something you want to compare to a normative database. Just look at the nerve fiber layer. It's very obvious. And you can see that even in your compass, uh, photographs uh, that the rest of the nerve fiber layer is completely normal, and yeah. Do, so don't don't look at uh, don't look at normative databases. Yeah, right there. You can see right here and right here. So the rest of the nerve fiber layer is normal. You can see it all around. So I implore you to uh, ignore the disc, not to worry about the cup to disc ratio, not to worry compared to the normative database, but just come look at the overall picture. Thank you. And I think the point here is the context of this disc. I mean, it does look on this picture at least, and I didn't, I didn't get the OCT size sizing of it, but it does look like a large optic canal, which may give us a false sense of so-called increased cupping. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe just, maybe just, let's just stick on this OCT for a second. This is, this is an interesting one because I think uh, as, as Sanjay just pointed out, uh, looking at the, um, I guess the, the, the reflectance map, uh, so to speak, you can see this uh, wedge defect, but the, re the rest of the RNFL, you know, does look pretty good, except near you, you were worried about something here. Maybe you can just explain to us what you were worried about. Well, I looked at, at the normative database and I looked at the averages, which are thin, but we've seen our images from 2009 not same machine, so hard to compare, which also had pretty thin RNFL. So in 2009, we're in 2020 now. So 2009, still different machine. Um, average RNFL was around 60. So now we're around 50. Um, and again, do we think about what we, about the vertical cup to this? I can tell you what I think it was when I looked in, but this is potentially more of an objective um, um, 
documentation and also even just looking at at the hood report um it, it looks scarier than than the visual field and maybe it, it is anticipating or we know that structure comes before function so are we gonna see this in the next year or so it's a relatively young okay, so so we have so we have, so sanji is not too worried about it you're worried about it um so and i'm, I'm happy just about the rest of the panelists Because I mean, as, as we all know, of course, normative database and red disease is a, is a common problem. At the same time, we don't want to miss something. If you go, let's look, can we look at the TISNIC curves? I wonder what, what both you and Sanjay would say about the TISNIC curves. Because I do, what, I, I do like looking at those TISNIC curves, which yeah, you, yeah, I'll leave you, it there you, for a second. If you stay on this, because I point out something else here. If you look at this uh, image of the RNFL thickness, you see some thinning here that thinning is very early. And that is going to be responsible for why there is possibly this loss here in the GCL. Uh, this, this thinning is pretty obvious and that's why this loss, but uh, th there is mild thinning here. You can see it in this reflectance picture, the on-face retina view. You can see that there is a darker area right here. And that is what is concerning to me. So I am I'm, I, I try not to look at the normative database because everybody is born with something different. Yeah, I think we all have seen people RNFL average being 52 and being completely normal. I agree. What do you think about what the statistic here? What do you think about, for example, the, the flattening of the split bundle here? Does that give us any, any concern or any question? You see where I drew this in pink? Like I, 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 I like to look at that. I like to see a good modulation because although, I mean, normal patients can be all over the place in terms of their average or their, or their, or their height of their peaks, but I would expect there to be more of a, of a, you know, of a, of a peak and not, a, not of a, of a, of a flattening effect. So, I mean, that's subtle again. Um, but I would also look at the Tisnet plot as an addition to what you, what you said, it doesn't, to me, it looks like it's absolutely terrible, but it doesn't look completely normal either. And I think that's what perhaps is also reflected in the, uh, in the thickness view and the GCL. Yeah, I mean, like if I just looked at this patient after seeing your now uh, a better answer segment OCT, even though it's post LPI, like we were saying, I, I don't think an angle closure eye would have opened that much. And then if he's been told his discs have looked abnormal before, and he's had pressures in the past. He probably had larger physiologic cupping and he's got thinning inferiorly, which is a little bit more characteristic, probably during the time when he was at higher pressures. And now with medications, he's under better control. And essentially, this might be one where if you're getting closer to like floor effects on some of your OCT changes, you might do better off looking at his visual field. I don't do a lot of FTT. But it's not unreasonable with a little bit of higher sensitivity, sometimes less specificity to, to continue with fields that way. And then a lot of this is rate of progression. Like we're not really seeing a, an, an aggressive rate of progression, so it doesn't make you want to act very quickly regardless. Exactly. So, so that's exactly my dilemma. That's why I brought it here. And this is basically the, the last slide asking what the um, crowd and what the panelists are thinking. So do we just sit on it for now? He is at least compliant at coming to follow-ups, which I'm happy about. So I tell him, listen, we're gonna, I'm gonna be seeing you every three, four months. And he, his office is just down, jump down the hall from mine. So he comes for appointments, uh, potentially, hopefully taking his drops. Um, do I add another drop, which he didn't like before? So it was not good on PGAs. Do I do a third SLT, which, I typically don't. Um, do I do any intervention? Do I do micropulse? I think certainly with a micropulse, I can bring him to lower teens or maybe or maybe to 10. Uh, but is the conjunctiva going to be as mobile if I need something else um, in the future? Do I actually go in and do a, a procedure? Do I do FACO MIGS? And if I if that is the choice, do I go and do a trabecular? Uh, a TM based procedure or maybe a subconj? Uh, do I do MIGS alone um, or, or something even more aggressive? So for now, my sense was just to monitor and see because I'm not 
under the impression that he's progressing or progressing fast. So that, that was my, uh, my understanding of this patient. But if um, I, can we do a poll? I think I, I gave this question as a poll, although I'm happy with Dr. Azrani and, and his results or his interpretation, because that's kind of what I was leaning to, but I would, it would be interesting in, in hearing uh, maybe the, the crowd's um, opinion about what the next step should look like. Can I just add oh. something? Because, because the OCT is actually like um, Dr. Arsani was saying that in the left eye, there are starting to get a little bit of loss in the superior part. And he has asymmetric pressures with the left eye being a bit more than the right. And even on the OCT, uh, sorry, on the visual field, maybe there was something on the central visual field defect there. So to me, I would, I guess, if you want to watch him now, just to get all those, like, you know, another 10-2, those would be some of the points that I would have to look out before because if it's if like I said if it's asymmetric pressures 18 with maybe left eye having central visual field loss I think something needs to be done whether it's adding preservative free prostaglandin maybe to to if he's having an allergy to prostaglandins or doing maybe a mixed procedure. Well, he, he tolerated make, uh, prostaglandins for two years, but again, I think the benefit you have here is it's time. And he's a very, very good patient. You can tell from all this, the, the, the examinations, all the follow-up, all the information you have, this patient will come to your clinic. If you tell him be here every three months for the next two years, you will have that benefit. He's not going to disappear. So. so we're going to launch the poll here. And I, I want to go back because we do have um, a couple of questions that have come up. One question was, how do you localize the scleral spur on antisemitic OCT? And I may get George to jump in on this. I know you don't have any visuals, but maybe you can just comment on that after Nir does. Um, I think that was one comment. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that was one of the comments that came up. And then there are other comments that come up is that people have been commenting like, wow, the, um, where is it here? The, uh, the GCL severe thinning um, and, and this is pathologic. Uh, I think Sanjay kind of commented on a little bit, but we should probably talk a bit about this and how to differentiate red disease from real disease, which I think is what this is about. Um, and I'm also curious about this 10-2 thing. And I'm, I'm curious about how that would change our management. Um, would it change our management or not? And that's, that's the third question. So, uh, let's, let's just, let's just hold those questions for a second. Uh, let me just uh, share the poll. This is what Nero was, was asking to share. I think you have the, the poll in front of you there, Neil. This is your crowdsourcing. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I've, I voted 20 times right now. <laughs> Are you surprised? Happily, no. <laughs> or thankfully, no. That, that, that was my sense. That was my sense. And, and again, just because I can see him and, and I tell him, you know, it's not we're going to see each other in a year. So you'll keep coming every three, four months. And he was actually, um, interestingly enough, at one point in my follow-up, I've already consented him for FACO Zen. And there was a reimbursement issue. And then he came back for another follow-up and pressure was slightly lower. And, and the tests seemed like, like we saw them. And we were like, well, I think we're okay to, to monitor for now. So, so I'm, I, I'm happy with a with a result. And what is, what is his lens status, Nir? I'm curious to see why people thinking about FACO. With open angles, yes, he's slightly hyper-O, but he's got trace nuclear sclerosis. So he's he is corrected. He he is slightly hyperopic. He does wear glasses. He's 20, 20, and they're progressive. He's 60. So he manages well with his vision. There are no visual complaints. So in that respect, there's no there's no urgency. Had there been a discussion on narrowing or angle closure, that would have been that would have kind of maybe tipped us over to doing a lensectomy. But but for now, I think uh, the lens is not an issue. Let me go back to the other OCT because I think maybe that's coming from some folks who are, believe this is angle closure. Um, I, I can and, show. And again, I, and again we we debated this earlier. I I, I wasn't overly convinced. Uh, even on these images. And again, we have to be very careful looking at antisemitic OCT. There's a lot of misinterpretation. This particular images have, have numerous issues with regards to the acquisition and the technical placement of the scans. It, the, these, are also, um, put this, these are also prone uh, to issues with regards to warpage uh, because we are not taking into account the coronal curvature here. 
uh, in these images with this machine, uh, the way they're done here. So I would be very worried about, about looking at it. So the, the, the next photograph you have, which I think, yeah, here, uh, which, you know, it's a bit more information here um, and better images um, has, you know, clearly a wide open angle. So I'm not, I agree with Vanessa. I'm not sure why anybody would do FACO here. No lens rise either. You know, I, I'm not convinced of that at all. The lens is, yeah, not at all high. But can we just go back to the question someone was asking about? Uh, a lot of people talk about the scleral spur being important to identify because we don't actually cannot usually, we cannot usually, although here you can in some images, you cannot usually see exactly where the canal of Schlem is. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. So we use scleral spur as a surrogate marker to look and see where we can identify that. And we know approximately 500 microns or one coronal thickness centrally, uh, you know, anterior to this would be where the TM would be. So the spur is something we look at. I wonder if you can just point out where it is and how, well, how, what different ways we have to identify the scleral spur on the of an OCT. So again, it depends which OCT. So um, the, the older generations are, are hard and we are harder to, to determine. And of course, the, the critical most point typically has artifacts. So um, this is what we had at the time. So, so that's what we took. Um, and that was in, in your acquisition. Um, on, on a higher definition and tier segment, and also uh, when we have a 12 millimeter um, scan, it is easier to, to notify or diagnose or um, identify, sorry, um, where the, the spiral spur is. Um, at times, you can actually, as you said, see uh, Schlem's canal as well. So we kind of see um, a slit, although you, you can't really see them here. So Nir, if I could uh, if I could comment about that, there's a there's a nice paper by the Wilmer Group in 2014 that kind of went through different landmarks to look for when you're uh, trying to identify scleral spur, and there's three basic ways of identifying it. So there's the bump method. So I don't know. I'm, I, I think I'm annotating here, so maybe you can see. So there's the bump here, which we can see here. This there's, Schwa there's um, Schwabi's line, which you can see here. There's a there's a U shape. So this U shape is where the Schwabi's line is. And then you go one millimeter back and this should be TM. And then the ciliary muscle, that's a little bit harder to- Use a different to... color, George. Yeah, use a different color than black. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know where- The it black and white kind of guy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Near, okay, here, Sanjay. Here. Till then, here you can go. you just clarify whether the- uh, the bottom uh, row, uh, the bottom row, is that belonging to the left eye and the top row belonging to the right eye? Exactly, exactly. That's so right. So if I may point out after George is done, there, are, there is another point I'd like to make. Go, go ahead, George. Yeah, so, so, so there you go. So we had, so we had the three different uh, landmarks there. So there was one here, one here with a bump method. And then the ciliary muscle, which is a little bit harder to identify here, but it, it sometimes can be a demarcation. I wonder if it's somewhere here, which kind of gets us to about scleral spur. So those three methods, if used together, they had about a 99% chance of figuring out where scleral spur was. Now, when, when it is closed, the angle, all these landmarks kind of get all mushed together and it becomes more difficult to identify which is which. And sometimes there's also been the bell... Um, uh, sign that kind of appears, which is kind of Schlem's, uh, Schlem's canal that that's been more recently described. Yeah, so the wonder... extra canalicular limbal lamina. And if you guys look at uh, Lauren Bleeden's paper, I don't remember what year, but they, they describe that really nicely with the histopath. It almost looks like a strut holding Schlem's open. Correct. That's, I think 20, yeah, they, they just recently published that the, 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 um, the Wilmer group had their initial three, uh, three landmarks back in 2014. But I think that's kind of a nice way to, to use the uh, anterior segment imaging to identify spur. And spur should really be your landmark when you're starting to uh, interpret these anterior segment OCTs. And then you can kind of move from there to, to figure out where your different uh, structures are and if the angle is open or not. So uh, Ike, this is Sanjay here. I just want to point out that the angle in the right eye, which is the upper one here, you can see this angle is much more open than the angle in the left eye. The, uh, this is the Schlem's canal here in the left eye up here. And 
you see this angle here is much narrower. You can even see there is an iris to TM touch in this quadrant of the left eye. Now, this narrowing of the left angle compared to the right angle is reflected in the greater amount of RNFL loss and ganglion cell loss in the left eye compared to that in the right eye. So just wanting to show you that intermittent angle closure in this left eye is possibly playing a role in the greater amount of RNFL loss in that left eye. The I think other Sanjay, thing I wanted to point out was that in the FDT that uh, Nir had shown, the, there was an inferior paracentral defect that was, yes, right there on the left eye that does correspond to the um, superior RNFL loss. So just going back to the OCT, I, I would definitely like to see more of these scans. It's hard, it was hard, hard, to, hard to see there in the corner. We don't have all the information that we can visualize here. Um, and I'm just looking and seeing where the scan is coming across. I mean, it's not centered on the pupil, but it looks like it's cutting right near, was it a temporal PI that was done, it looks like? Yeah. Near? Yeah, I did. Right? Yes. So, so it, it looks like you have, you know, you have a, a scan going right to the superior edge of the temporal PI, we should probably write about there. And so I don't know, I just would be careful using that as a, as a marker of how the angle status is for 360 degrees. On this side, I pretty, feel, feel pretty good though, that the angle is, is, is not, does not look close to me. Um, and you know, I, I feel that the, the likelihood of having angle closure, even intermittent to me at least, just what I have here right now is hard to really justify. But there must but be I do something want to point the asymmetric out the pressure. asymmetry in the angle opening between the two eyes. Yeah, I mean, I guess I just it's hard for me to use the one on the on the bottom, just um, particularly the um, the temporal side. Uh, nasally, if you compare nasally, yeah, I think there's a bit more of an angle recess in the right eye, which is why why the left eye has a bit looks like it has a bit of a higher iris insertion. If I want to point out here, you have a bit more angle recess here. You here you don't have an angle recess. And so the angle insertion is higher in this eye than in the, than in, than in the than in the right eye. And so in that sense, there is some uh, there is some uh, there there is more opening in the in the super in the right eye. But both eyes are pretty open, though. Is I guess what I'm saying. And this yes. right here, I just wouldn't I would I wouldn't be able to I would want to see more images. I guess before I jump to that. Yeah. But, but your points well taken. After LPI, you. so the, you know this this opening level, uh, we don't know, we don't really have a good image pre LPI. These are after LPI, so. Yes, but sometimes um, when you, sometimes in the air, the PI, you get some Sinechia formation or something, or you get some, you know, iris that, that is, um, you know, elevated or frayed strands, right? So I'm always yeah, worried. but if... Nir, Nir is a good, good, good doctor. <laughs> well, he did them temporally, and I will give him credit for that, because uh, as many of you know, uh, we've been really pushing temporal PIs for the reduction yeah. of dysphotopsia, so that's probably going to be another to point controversy. Out, I... You may recollect our discussion in 2009 when you started doing it temporarily and I started doing it nasally. And uh, yes. since then, the optical uh, phenomena uh, has significantly decreased. I'd rather be on the side of Sanjay Sarandi than anyone else, so thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to get your feedback. Can we, can we go to the other thing, just a point about the OCT, and I, and I know it's been a, been a big discussion here, but I, I think, it, it's been really reinforced here that, be, and I think we talked about this last time with Mesh Lenker when he presented, but we must be very careful with looking at absolute numbers and comparing to averages and looking at red because uh, we have you know, so much variability in the human anatomy and, uh, and compared to normal databases can throw us off sometime. And I think this, this discussion, I think gave us some good uh, food to, to talk about uh, that aspect of it. So thank you, Nir. Uh, I mean, that's exactly what we, we want to see some good discussion. You have some crowdsourcing here. I mean, if I could just give my, my last opinion, I totally agree with the crowd. I would not be overly aggressive here. I mean, I'm not convinced this patient needs anything more. Anything we do could, could result in, in, in adverse events. Uh, and so um, I, 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 think, I think, you know, I think you're quite um, justified in observing him conservatively. And I mean, 18, yeah, I mean, we don't necessarily like 18 when someone has progressive disease or when they have advanced disease, but I'm not convinced of that. The central visual field is an interesting one. I mean, I know Dima mentioned it as well. I mean, would it change their mind? 
I'm not sure it would change my mind either because I'd, I'd want to see that it's actually a progressive problem with the pressures being in the normal range. And if we actually felt it was progressing at normal pressures and it was open angle, then I think that you're kind of forced to then do something pretty aggressive. And that's, again, a bigger jump to make. And just doing FACO alone, I don't know if it would be enough. Uh, so you, you've given us some great discussion points. Uh, and I think, um, you know, uh, you, you've gotten the right attitude as far as what we need to look at. So thank you for sharing that. You're mute, Nir. No, no, thank you very much. It was very important for me to, to get everyone's opinion. Thank you. I see why you're a mute. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, let's, uh, let, let's go to our, our next presentation, which actually would be me. And I wanted to just share with you um, some, uh, some, some approaches and an understanding of dyslotopsia. This has been a topic that uh, has come up in some of our discussions. And we'll flip a bit and go talk about uh, something much easier, uh, which is not glaucoma. <laughs> Uh, and I also also apologize for the many people, not many, but some people who have commented about how bad my hair is today. Uh, so I've already got a few of your comments already. So I'm glad Sanji, I'm glad Sanji didn't criticize me about my hair. I've, I've seen some comments though that have, so I apologize. Yeah, that's why I'm, my video is not on because I'm on the <laughs> other side. I don't have much hair to talk about. <laughs> these, these are my disclosures uh, with, with, uh, with, with companies I consult or, or I do research with. So, you know, we, we've all done cataract surgery. Most of us have done cataract surgery. We all know how great the results are. Uh, and, you know, these have become very gratifying surgeries. Uh, but when we have a situation like this, where the uh, patient is, uh, looks like they're doing great, the vision is 20-20, everything looks like it's uh, in order, but the patient's upset because they have unwanted images, it of course gives us great consternation. And actually, I'm just going to just, before I just continue along, I'm actually going to just optimize my image uh, quality here for one second here. There we go again. I've always had a bit of trouble with Zoom and the, and the image quality, so I hope this will, uh, this will play okay. So let me just give a bit of, a, a bit of a, an overview on dysphotopsia, and I'm going to get our panelists to give some commentary as well. The easiest way, I think, to, differ, to divide up dysphotopsia is whether they are positive or whether they're negative. And, and again, I apologize for some of the basicness of this, but we have a very wide audience, some of, some of who are early in their career, others who are very, very uh, experienced. But positive is basically a bright, unwanted image. Usually it's, it's uh, stimulated by a bright object or a reflection. Negative dyslotopsia is a dark image or a shadow uh, and typically manifests in modern day IOLs temporally. And we'll talk a bit about why that may be the case. Usually these are generated in, in light circumstances uh, this is different than photophobia, uh, although photophobia and glare can obviously be a little bit uh, difficult to differentiate. Usually, right to autopsy, we talk about glare, halos, and starbursts. So, again, positive autopsia typically are bright phenomena, halos, arc, flare, starburst, central flash. These have all been terms that have been used to describe unwanted IOL images. Glare, of course, is also in that group. We also know that there are certain characteristics of the lens that may increase the risk of this. Very obviously, would, for example, be multifocal lenses. We know the increased risk of halos and glare with multifocal lenses for reasons that have been discussed many times. We, we do believe, and ba based on basic science, that lenses with higher index of refraction may have a higher risk of developing some uh, positive dysphotopsia. Optic size plays a role, and the edge uh, also plays a role of the lens and the finish, as well as the optic design itself. Negative dysotopsia, again, which is typically more of a darkness phenomena, typically more of a peripheral phenomena that we see, uh, is, uh, again, uh, felt to be more so related to the IOL edge and how it's finished. When we think about dysotopsia, though, we, of course, need to first rule out other causes. And it's important not to just go to the lens. I get many patients who are referred to me that are referred because of what they feel is IOL dysotopsia. And indeed, the problem is something other than IOL dysphotopsia. The problem may be surface related or cornea related. It may be from a capsule related problem. Uh, and it may be more posterior in positioning. So be mindful of that before we jump into the IOL. Of course, we also cannot ignore the IOL can be an issue. When it comes to dysphotopsia, and the fellows know this and, and who have trained with me, uh, this is very much like a neurologist where we have to use history more than anything else with some, of course, clinical signs to help differentiate and determine where the problem is. 
when there's a focal neurological de deficit in a certain dermatome, this can track back to potentially where, for example, in the brain uh, or the brainstem on the spinal cord or peripheral nerve pathology where the, where the problem may be. And, and this is very much like in dysphotopsia where we have to kind of track back thinking of where the history, where the history takes us. One of, the, one of the most common, of course, symptoms with, uh, with the visual symptoms in general is glare. The problem with glare is it's very nonspecific. It's non-localizing is what I'm saying. It doesn't necessarily point to a certain part of the eye or lens, which is potentially the problem. It can be any of that. And this is where, again, having uh, clinical knowledge, proper examination, and again, a history is important in determining this. For example, when it comes to dysphotopsia, <clears throat> do these phenomena typically happen during daytime hours, indoor, with lighting, or at nighttime while driving and walking, for example? Is it intermittent or always there, and what aggravates it? Is the phenomena more centrally or more peripheral in your visual field, and is it monocular or binocular? These are important differentiating points. Historically, did it happen right after surgery, or did it happen months later, or did it happen after laser was done? Is the problem occurring more when, the, when, the, when a light is shone in the eye directly in front of you, or is it from the light that's coming from the side, tangential, or from above? And is it round and halo and starburst-like, or is it linear in nature, or is it focal in nature within the visual field? So you can see it's not a simple phenomenon just to say I have glare uh, or a patient has glare. It's important to differentiate what they are. One of the, one of the important things to look at in terms of examination is where is, this, where is the problem in terms of the glare source or the dysphotopsia source? Is it from a central light or from a peripheral light? A central light uh, may imply certain things versus a tangential light source applies, implies other issues. For example, a point source of light like a pen light or a headlight can result in any, any series of central visual phenomena, glare, halos, and starbursts. These are typically phenomena that occur because of light striking an edge between two different refractive indices, for example, or light being bent uh, along an edge uh, of an IOL, or for example, for diffractive rings or, or zonal rings in a refractive lens, or maybe catching an edge, for example, on a capsule behind the IOL. Um, and of course, the most common cause, we would have to say before anything else, is refractive. And we have to always rule out refractive uh, causes for defocused light, because any defocused light will give us, of course, the essence of a halo uh, or potentially what would be called glare. Again, glare to patients mean de many different things. Glare is not really a, a great term, even as far as how we use it. On the other hand, tangential lights that are coming from an angle can strike uh, the, the lens and can result in reflected or refracted light that can again result in a dysphotopic phenomena. And this can occur again, positive or negative. We'll get into that a bit later on. And so we, we think about light coming in at a tangent and an angle. And again, depending on the, on the angle of incidence, different phenomena can occur. When the light is, re is internally reflected or refracted, it can strike the peripheral retina and cause again a peripheral phenomena that may occur a positive or negative phenomena. To differentiate some of these things, uh, we can do a meiotic test, which in some cases can help to, again, identify the issues. Again, they don't necessarily uh, you know, give a diagnosis. For example, someone who has a lot of corneal hyoid aberration and has a lot of spherical aberration in a large pupil may have a patient, may have a benefit of having meiotic. A patient who has, for example, a large pupil and is catching an edge of a lens may benefit from having meiotic as well. And of course, a patient who has multifocal lenses may benefit from having meiotic. So meiotic doesn't necessarily help to identify the actual diagnosis, but they can help narrow down some of the issues. And the dilation test is also used in certain situations. And we particularly use this, for example, in patients who have negative dysphotopsia, because negative dysphotopsia typically improves when patients are dilated. And of course, positive dysphotopsia would get worse. If a dilated pupil, you see an edge of a lens, for example. Of course, as I said before, ocular surface is really important to look at. Very common source of, uh, of glare and dysphotopsia. Corneal issues and epithelial issues, of course, are problematic as well. And uh, endothelium needs to be evaluated because this can also be a source of glare in, in essence as well. So we need to first look at all of these aspects as well. We do use topography and aberrometry to evaluate both localized as well as entire eye wavefronts and scatter. Um, we, of course, know that higher aberration can result also 
in dysphotopsia, particularly with positive dysphotopsia. Uh, Spherical collaboration is something we commonly talk about, but coma can also cause a flare-like phenomena, a comet-like phenomena, what, what, what we have called flare. Um, again, it's very, it's very helpful to look at the cornea and we, we can look in detail. We can obviously look at the axial curvature map and see that some of the problems that have occurred, for example, in some patients, uh, some patients have had previous laser ablation example. And in this case, we can see the patients who have a higher amount of asphericity or a higher amount of irregularity or coma in this case and vertical, uh, sorry, spherical aberration as well. So these are just more examples here. Of course, if a patient has a small pupil, these are less of an issue, but are important to evaluate. Ray tracing is also helpful here as well, because we can also look at the internal optics of the eye wavefront to evaluate. And we'll get back, get into this in a, shortly. Same thing again, looking at uh, skyoscopy using the OPD uh, analyzer, we can also look at uh, total and corneal versus internal refractive um, powers to evaluate where the problem may lie. And then we can use double pass technology like the HD analyzer to look at ocular scatter, which of course can be related to surface issues, but also can be related to optical issues within the eye as well. And we can see the difference, for example, in, in the patient on the left versus the patient on the right. We can see a higher amount of ocular scatter index uh, and the one on the left. Of course, cataract is one of the most common causes of, of ocular scatter. So this is helpful, of course, in someone who is has an IOL um, and one is looking for causes of their glare and dysphotopsia. This is also nice because it helps differentiate uh, tear film from lenticular problems for an example. In a tear film example, we see a degradation of scatter or an increase in scatter over time, over a 12 second period or 20 second period for which this test is, is done. On the other hand, if the tear film is not an issue, we typically see a very stable ocular scatter and a high ocular scatter, which tells us that the scatter is probably more related to not the tear film, but something else. Uh, again, we talk about we talk about peripheral pathology like this, and we see things like uh, like like tangential light sources causing problems, flare, and we see issues like this, uh, where we have a patient who's describing a very distinct peripheral um, arc pattern uh, reflection that's occurring in their left side in one, and this is a monocular phenomena. Um, maybe, maybe I'll just take a pause for a second here and, when, and maybe I'll ask our panelists uh, if they would like to, uh, to pitch in here. When you have someone like this, and let's just give an example here, a patient who has had otherwise unremarkable surgery and comes to see you and is complaining of this problem since the surgery uh, where they have this, uh, with a light source that's placed in front of them and they have this curved arc on the side of their vision or in the case of a tube light, they have this peripheral phenomena to the left side of their, of their vision and it's a bright phenomena. Any thoughts that go into your mind as far as what you're thinking of that could be causative here? So these are the type of cases that uh, I think it's important to really have a good exam and where you're kind of trying to replicate or at least mimic what, what the patients are seeing to kind of better figure out uh, what's the cause of this. So uh, anterior, uh, your slit lamp exam has to be complete. Look at your iris, make sure that there's no iris defects, make sure the lens is well positioned, that there's no tilt, that it's not out of the bag, that it's not both haptics are in the bag, the capsule is properly centered, uh, not too much, uh, that has good overlap over, the, over 360 degrees, whether there's a capsulotomy, capsular pacification. And, um, and then you have to make sure when you're talking to the patient that this is something that really happened right after surgery and that it's not something that developed later on. If this is like constant and consistent since the day of surgery, then it's probably related to something that, that you did. If it happened later on, then it could be capsule-related contracture or, or uh, a pacification in the capsule. Um, and then you can that's, mimic... That's a, that's a great distinction before you continue. Is did, Was it immediately after surgery or was it maybe like a month later? Because a lot of times we'll jump to YAG capsulotomy. And then if you're going to do anything surgically, it makes it a lot more difficult. So when you're assessing a patient, I, I love that distinction. Did it happen right away or did it develop later on? Yeah, it's a great it's a great point. I think that really helps us to kind of differentiate, you know, you know where the problem may lie, although things can be fluctuate in general as well. And I think, George, I think you kind of talked quite well as far as when you think about this, you got to think about something, uh, you know, perhaps in the iris or something with the lens. In this case, you can see actually the lens is, uh, is subluxed. And the reason why the lens is subluxed here, if I can just point out uh, my marker here, you can see the lens is in a bag stalker position. You can see in this case here, 
one, one optic and haptic is sitting outside the bag and the other is inside the bag. And this has resulted in, in some lens tilt. And you can see the edge of the lens here, visualized in the, in the pupil space as well. Now, sometimes when the pupil is not very large, it's not very obvious, but just because you don't see the edge of the lens doesn't mean the patient can't get an edge phenomena that can occur. And believe it or not, this patient had this problem for years, for years uh, after their surgery. Um, and yet, unfortunately, nothing was uh, done about it uh, and nothing was, uh, was resolved for the patient. Um, and actually, when we, start, when we did internal aberrations, as I mentioned earlier, this is a, something we look at as well. This is ray tracing. We can actually see internally the differential refractive map here on the wavefront here. And we see actually evidence where we have the, where we have, uh, the uh, refractive changes here because of the tilting of the lens within, with, with also potentially some induced astigmatism that can occur. And so, you know, we don't necessarily need to have ray tracing to identify this, but it kind of does help us to look at this. And in this case here, I won't, I won't play the whole video here, but basically we're able to reposition the lens back into the capsular bag. And you can see the lens now and the UBM is sitting nicely here. And we have been able to resolve the patient's problem. So that's obviously a structural problem with the lens out of position, which should be identified. Of course, PCO is probably the most common reason why we see patients uh, after surgery and, and who have patients who have problems with visual blurring as well as dysphotopsia. Um, these can be, uh, of course, in different ways, fibrotic versus pearl formation. Uh, they can be focal and localized, as you see here in these examples, uh, and they can fit different patterns. Um, this patient here, I'm gonna give you an image that the patient kind of brought in as far as what they were describing, uh, is a phenomenon that they described with basically uh, halos and some glare around, around bright lights. And they said, basically, this problem got worse over time they had a laser capsule audio image which, which didn't, didn't resolve the problem. I'm gonna stop there maybe and ask our panelists. I'm not gonna, not gonna give all the information here, but what, what's going through your mind when you hear this story where the patient was doing pretty well early on after surgery, it's a monofocal lens. They, uh, they basically had uh, some visual you know, blurring. They had a capsule audio done. They're reporting halos and glare here or uh, in starbursts. Yeah, so the, the halos and glare, uh, usually you kind of start moving toward like a spherical aberration issue. Um, and it, it could be anywhere from corneal to lens material, even endothelial. Uh, so initially, actually, I think if people have access to topographer, even like a wavefront analyzer, just to see if there are higher order aberrations. Now, why did they develop down the line? I mean, some of this you have to ask them, is it at night or is it, at dark, or is it uh, during the daytime? because the pupil size is gonna to matter too. Um, and if they've had prior LASIK and now they're experiencing this more at nighttime potentially, then you could be out of that kind of refractive zone and that's giving them the more uh, positive uh, glare-like symptoms. If things progress down the line, then you have to look at things like fuchs. Um, did the endothelium start to decompensate and now you're getting more of a positive phenomenon? Um, but even eyewall material can cause uh, can cause this. And sometimes patients, if they've had corneal edema immediately after surgery, they just have a general sense of blur. And as things come into focus, um, some of these higher order aberrations can, can come to, to fruition where they actually can, can tell you exactly what's happening. I was going to say too, that maybe if the bag changes, if this contractor to the bag with time, something that's, that evolves, that's somewhere where you can say, oh, well, this, this is new, this is phimosis or something that's starting to happen that could induce uh, these uh, halo changes. And I mean, PCO is like the most common thing and that's typically um, what might cause a starburst type of effect for people. I was gonna say the size of the PCO, yeah, mm -hmm. the egg. So I think probably most people probably would maybe, well, let me ask you this, this patient, this patient comes to you and they're reporting halos and starbursts. They've had a capsulotomy done. What do you guys think? Small. Well. Can a small capsulotomy cause halos and glare? Yes. Did it start after the capsulotomy? Yeah, you said it started. Did it get worse? Oh, yeah, I, I didn't want to make it so obvious, but yeah, the patient's kind of vague a bit about it, but they do kind of say, yeah, you know what? It seems to have gotten worse after my laser capsulotomy. Yeah, I, th I think this is this can really be quite well explained by this capsulotomy size. and. And it's, uh, this is why it's nice to always try to keep the, the capsulotomy as large as you can with pretty much the optic edge if you can. Now, if it's a bit of a difficult situation and the, you had zonular issues or your, antler, your lens is 
a little bit unstable after surgery, that's a different story. But most of the time, it's nice to have a bigger, wider capsulotomy. Yeah, this is basically an aperture issue where you're, again, you're getting light hitting the edge of this lens diffracted and uh, essentially causing um, a, second, a second image. It's basically, think of it like a diffractive ring on a multifocal lens. Uh, and, so, and so, yeah, not, not all cases, but this is something that we have to look at. And I think the answer here is really to, uh, to enlarge the capsulotomy and doing this uh, can often resolve the problem. And I still get these cases referred. That's why I put, that's why I put this up here. Uh, I think it is something to look at. Now, interestingly enough, a small anterior capsulotomy, this is a posterior capsulotomy that's been done. A small anterior capsulotomy typically doesn't give us the same problems. Typically, I should say. Um, and I don't know if anyone wants to talk about why, they, why, why it's different when it's posterior versus anterior. Any thoughts on that? I mean, we don't, we don't, we don't necessarily see this when you have a small capsulotomy. We don't like small capsulotomies. Small capsulotomies can actually cause a visual blur because of diffraction as well around the edge of the uh, of the uh, capsulotomy. One of it's the size. So it, typically, like an anterior capsule won't find most down small enough to where it's it's going to affect it. But the other one can also be the penumbra or the the uh, the shadow that's cast, similar to if you have like uh, vitreous opacities that don't cast the shadow all the way to the retina. Things that are a little bit more anterior IOL might not actually make it all the way back to, to the retina to where they cause symptoms. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right, Arshan, because basically the light has not yet been refracted through the lens itself. Um, and so I think that's one phenomena as well that, 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 that I think we see. And also the problems with, with these issues are not that a small capsulotomy, but the fact that it's a small capsulotomy and there's still light getting through the peripheral side of it as well. Uh, as opposed to just having like a pinhole effect from a small pupil, which we wouldn't expect to get, for example, a dysphotopsia. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, you know, again, people who have described halos around license post-op day one, that's a historical issue. I think it's really helpful to know that because, you know, don't think of PCO right away. Of course, if you've left stuff on the capsule, maybe yes. But in general, we start thinking about, uh, about not the posterior capsule. We start thinking about other phenomena. And you know this is an example where, yes, there's some there's some PCO, uh, but I want to point out the fact that this patient here has an edge of an IOL that is not complete in terms of its refractive power. So what I mean by that is for lenses, for example, let me see if I can draw in here. For lenses, for example, um, from certain certain designs, the optic power doesn't go to the very peripheral of the lens. So here, for example, is the peripheral of the lens. Okay, I wrote that in, I wrote that in pink. In blue, I'm writing the capsulotomy, which is here, okay? Here's the capsulotomy that's going around, okay? But then I wanna point out something else, which probably some of you see. You know, what is this and what is this edge here? And of course, there's some, there's some PCO and stuff over here, yes. But again, this patient here has had problems since, uh, since day one. And anybody want to comment on on what what what, I'm, what I was pointing out in green? Like like what like, what is what are these what are these lines here? This is not the cops. This is not the anterior capsulotomy. Looks like the refraction of the and the optic doesn't go all the way to the edge. What you were mentioning. Yeah, so mo I'm surprised most people don't know this, but. Uh, with certain lenses of lower index of refraction, the optic power of the lens doesn't go up to six millimeters. It's an incomplete powered lens. So for example, let's suppose this is a, this is, let's just say, for example, this is a, a 28 diopter lens, right? That diopter power doesn't go all the way out to here. It only goes up to here, for example, right? And so what you're seeing then is an area of the lens that is changed, which is basically this area here, or the, or the flange of the lens. And so this flange results in a differential curvature peripherally here, a transition zone, so to speak. And in certain pupil sizes, certain pupil sizes, this can potentially be a problem. So this is, this is the transition zone here. And this is what potentially can cause, again, uh, halos and glare. Um, this zone, for example, centrally may be only 4.8 millimeters from here to here, for example, and the rest of it is non-powered or is reduction in power. Um, I hope the drawing, are the drawings showing up to you guys or no? Hopefully you can see them. If you can't, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, and so this is particularly a, a potential problem if 
the pupil is large enough. Of course, if the pupil is small, no big deal. Uh, but if the pupil is large enough, let me just close my annotation here, then it could potentially be an issue. Like in this particular patient, this patient's scotopic pupil, mesopic pupil was over six millimeters. And this could potentially be an issue. Uh, and so uh, these are dilemmas, they're not common. But again, these are monofocal lenses that potentially can cause halos because of this, uh, of this flange effect. Now some patients, and the reason why manufacturers do this, I should mention, is to keep the lens thickness size down to allow it to go through a small incision. So other manufacturers have a high incident refraction and therefore don't have to have such a thick lens to basically put the power in the eye. And these patients uh, have a full optic power. Uh, of course, there's other problems with having potentially a high incident refraction, mind you. So there is plus and minus on this as well. And so, yes, as some people have asked, it is dependent on the power. Um, it is also dependent on the manufacturer and what their refractive index is. Um, and, and this is, again, uh, a phenomenon that we do sometimes see. In that particular example, by the way, I should I should I gave it away, but I basically I, I was going to ask the panelists if you guys have encountered this and what have you done for these cases. Um, in fact, I, maybe I can just share a poll here uh, with what you may do in this case, where where we identify this issue. And these are some, some of the op this patient again is having ha has particularly problems with with halos and starbursts around lights uh, and pilocarpine drops. I should mention improve the symptoms. So that is something that can be used. Of course, it's not necessarily the best thing for patients long run to have to put them on pilocarpine drops, but yes, uh, they can be used as well. So go ahead and vote. We'll get some participation. And then maybe we'll get the panelists to talk about if you guys have seen this and what, what have you done about this? Any comments? No? I mean, I've seen I've seen this mostly in uh, in fellowship. To be uh, <laughs> to be quite honest, I haven't had the referrals source yet to to, to get all these uh, patients sent uh, this way. But uh, I think this yeah. is a great case to do uh, to do pupil pupilplasty on to get that pupil size down and and uh, try to avoid the optic edges there and and uh, and try to you know minimize the symptoms. Yeah, and Ike, we had we had one with um, just a little bit of I think it was like maybe 0.7 or something like corneal sill, and they were really happy with the cosmetic contact lens actually. Mm. So okay. after that, yeah. yeah. But I mean, you know, again, it is it is pretty rare. It's a good point. Yeah. So so yeah, and then that's what, that's exactly what we did. We uh, we ended up doing a pupilplasty, and I well exchange may not be enough here because even with a six millimeter full optic. Mm -hmm. We we weren't we weren't confident we would get there, and of course this is an extreme example. I'm just putting it up here as an extreme yeah, example. But it seems like the the pilo guides you right. Like if that yes. works, and and that's that's why we went the contact lens route, and then this would be the next step. Okay, this patient here uh, comes in, and they basically have said, "Listen, I see like these lines in my eye when I'm looking at lights, and they're like straight, uh, and they have they they started they started pretty early after surgery, and they're and they're still there, and they really bother me." Again, without showing you the pictures here, what goes through your mind when you think when you see something like this? This some look your folds. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Like poster capsule folds, exactly. decimate folds. Yeah. Or TIDs. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> and I think I think we heard it from we heard it from the chat group as well. Yes, this is a maddish raw phenomena from capsule stria, which again, I think people are kind of are into the and onto this and they understand this, but uh, I still get referrals for this, and I thought we'd put it up here. And the stria can occur typically along the axis of the uh, of the haptic, and are more common in three piece than one piece lenses, um, and often are asymptomatic and non -pro non problematic, but they can be. And, and the answer to this, I mean, how do you guys treat this? Panelist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Caps a lot of. Yeah, absolutely. Do a YAG on this one, and it and it will resolve it. And that and that's and that is exactly what the, what the what the answer is for that one. So be be mindful of that. Um, of course, these are very obvious problems with uh, with large iris defects, um, and these require iris sutures and repairs. Which of course uh, it makes it makes sense. But I, I do want to point out cases like this, where this patient here comes to you and says, you know what? Since surgery, man, I've had this really bothersome glare, as they call it. And they say basically like they can't look at lights. They have this light phenomena in their temporal field when they're looking at a headlight or looking at a light in front of them. And it really bothers them. They got to close their eye. 
So when I when I when I when I look at the eye and look at the examination here, the surface is fine, the cornea is fine. Uh, I didn't see any PCO or anything. The lens looks okay, but what what do you think about this picture here? Yeah, so we, we we're kind of losing the pupillary rough there, and uh, you wonder if there's some thinning of the iris tissue, and so this is where um, you know avoiding any. Um, any iris prolapse or uh, any excessive iris manipulation at the time of cataract surgery is crucial. And, you know, at the beginning of fellowship, I would have never thought that this is a problem. The iris, oh, okay, who cares? You know, a little bit of prolapse, we push it back in, we shove it back in, we use a couple of cannulas to poke through it and push it back into the eye. And then these patients come back and they're symptomatic. And uh, so this is where it's really important to manipulate the iris with a lot of delicacy and be really cautious of causing these uh, uh, atrophic zones within it uh, because they can be bothersome for some patients that uh, are prone to that. And it doesn't always have to be iatrogenic. So in this distribution where you have like the, uh, the vascular distribution of iris leaflets, so zoster, uh, herpetic eye disease can actually give you necrosis in that focal area. You'll lose the rough. You actually see the iris is thinner here. And that could be enough, especially in a light colored pupil to where that would cause uh, positive dysphotopsias. Did you do TIs, Ike? Sorry? Did you do transillumination? Yes. So uh, that's 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 the next thing I was going to show you here. Is uh, is this? Is this is the same patient? You see the loss of pupillary rough, and you can see this here. Now, uh, the, 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 I should mention here that that the pupil the pupil issue here is I don't I don't believe this is the problem here. For example, I don't I don't think this is causing us problems, the lack the loss of some pupillary but, rough. No, no, but it points to where you yes. should look, though. And that's, yeah. Yeah, I, I knew exactly what you're talking about, Arsh. I want to yeah. make sure people knew that. You're absolutely yeah. right. Okay. This is not the problem, but it actually tells you that there was likely some trauma or some problem intraoperatively or, or non nitrogenically, as you said, that may indicate where the problem is. And in fact, you see now translumination defects. Now, many of you will argue and say, guys, this is not, this cannot cause a problem. It's so subtle. Uh, how can my patient be bothered by it? The, and so the, it's true. Uh, many times patients tolerate it and that's the visual system. And that's why we see mm -hmm. a high degree of com compensation and tolerability for many different things that we think could be a problem, not a problem. But the point is it can be a problem and it's important to identify it. And before I go further, I should mention a couple of things because I think I, I'm glad that I think Amadeep made a comment on this one that, that when we're talking about treating these things, it's important not to rush into these. Many of these problems can get better with time, mm -hmm. including capsular folds. And so I think, uh, I know that Arshim talked about yagging them. I don't know, how long do you wait before yagging, for example, a capsule to fold in the previous example? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to go at least like one to two months out, but generally after that, it's a pretty static process. You're not gonna get a whole lot of change there. And, um, and if they're still bothered by that time, then, then that's when I would do it. Yeah, I think for any dysphotopsy, a positive or negative, I think you should wait. And I, and I would be conservative and wait, you know, several months, uh, often six months even for some situations. But I think you're right. When the symptoms start to basically become pretty stabilized as you follow the patient, and some patients are going to push you more than others, depending on what's required, uh, one will intervene. So it's important to, to remember that. Same, same with this, for this example. Once the capsule opacifies, if it does, then these translumination defects may become less of a problem. So there's no, no reason to rush in and fix this problem. Uh, you can wait and you can wait for the capsule to opacify and wait several times. The cases that I've had to treat are often referred to me after a year or, or longer. And the patient is quite problematic and quite debilitated by this. So this is the problem you see here. And this patient, what we did is we, we shot a pen light to the patient's peripheral temporal part of their eye. Uh, and it actually simulated uh, the problem they're getting. We, did the, we looked at the other eye and we did the same thing, focused light through the translumination defect and the patient didn't didn't report the problem. You, you mean at the slit lamp, right? At the slit lamp, sorry, yes. Yeah, exactly. Even for like LPIs, if you're going to thinking, is it is it really the PI that's causing the issue? Or if they're just getting kind of vague glare symptoms, do you think it's IOL versus PI? You can shine the light really small right through the pupil. They'll be like, yeah, I see the light. Move over to where the PI is. It's not gonna recreate the symptom, but they'll say, yes, the symptom, the, the light that I'm seeing now is scattering in the same area where I was seeing it before. And that tends to kind of point me toward the, it's the iris issue. It's a great tool to use. I totally agree. Focus light uh, in the area and see if it can, if it can evoke a similar phenomena symptomatically. Um, how are you going to treat this? We have a poll going on here, but what, what, what do you guys think, panelists? You want to wait for the answers or? or uh... No, go ahead. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, so, like, on a really thin iris, um, it, it's going to be tougher to suture because even your iris sutures are going to uh, leave some areas of TID in holes, um, depending on what the capsule and the phimosis looks like. In the U.S., it's a lot more difficult, but um, mortar segments would be my preferred route, except for us, it's a four- to six-month ID exempt exemption process. And I should I mention also contact lens is also an option as yeah. well. Like yeah. you, you mentioned earlier is an option. I find most patients are not too keen on it, but that's something they put in there as well. It's true. I was going to say with those types of deficits, they're not that large. And yes, it is blue iris with tissue, which is a little bit more uh, difficult to suture. I think this is something that we can suture with like some over uh, yeah. overbites on either side. And, um, and then putting in a mortar segments, of course, if, if that's, if it's a more uh, extensive deficit, I think that's, that's totally uh, reasonable. Yeah, and I do agree. These are thin iris, and I will caution that um, that trying to suture these sometimes can create a bigger problem. And as I as I showed on the on the video here, um, it, they do transluminate quite uh, quite readily here. And we're going to pass. You can see the thinning of the iris there. We're going to basically pass this uh, tenoproline suture in the uh, peripheral to the defects. I was prepared to do multiple passes. I'm trying to do it in one pass. You can actually see the needle through the translumination quite easily there. Um, and make, a, make an overbite, as you said, to imbricate the tissue, uh, over sew it, so to speak. And this uh, has to be done very carefully here to avoid any traction on the iris because that needle can cause a larger hole exactly. or a larger opening and cause bigger problems. So that is definitely something to be really, really mindful of. If it were really peripheral, if it were really peripheral and focal, what's another option that's potentially not like in, as in yeah. Yes, thank you for thank you for mentioning that. What is the other option? You're right. Vanessa's tattoo. No. Tattoo. We went to Vanessa. Eh? She's got the yeah, tattoos yeah. going. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, you're absolutely right, and we do that for PI sometimes. So, it's a very good point. This was this was kind of a larger central area, so we didn't want to tattoo it. But I think it's a very very good point, and I think using micro tires like this allow us to really pull the suture without putting traction on the iris. It's very subtle, um, but uh, that's enough to get the iris together. And now you see, I bring the light down, depending on what mic microscope you have. I have a Leica. I can make my red reflex really small and turn the peripheral light off and I can see it quite nicely how I was able to cover the, uh, cover the periphery there. And now you can see the um, TID fits have gone. The rich illumination have gone. And I, I think it's very important that, that you're doing that in the OR because from the original stitching, I felt like the superior aspect of it, now it's going to be a problem. But then you confirm, okay, there's no more transillumination seen in here. So that's very helpful. Yeah. And I think uh, as, as, uh, as Arsham said, uh, Irish this patient complained of significant post-operative light sensitivity and glare. Um, and you can see this, this patient has a much larger area a translumination, translumination that we're just pointing out here. And yeah, we could have sutured this, but it would be a lot of suturing and a big area to suture. So in this case, basically we, we opened the capsular bag, we uh, dissected open the eye well. Now I must say this was, this was, this patient was at least, I think about, I don't know, eight, nine months out. And she had had both eyes done. Uh, and, and of course, when you have both eyes done, you compare one versus the other. And the other, I had no TI defects. And this one did, and, and she was very bothered by it. So we're taking the eye out of the bag. We're going to use a Morcher Iris Prosthesis, which is a black uh, modified ring, PMA ring. And we're going to put it into the capsular bag. Of course, if the patient had a capsulotomy done, then I would caution against this. In fact, I probably wouldn't try it even. Uh, and if the patient had a lot of capsular somerings rings and other problems, uh, I wouldn't bother. And the patient probably wouldn't have a problem because they have capsular fibrosis and vasification. We see this, this patient's capsule was barely reactive here. And there's the, uh, the prosthesis in the area of the bag. We put the eye well back into the capsular bag behind the prosthesis, and that can be done. Someone also mentioned a pinhole eye well. Yes, you're right. We can use the, the, um, the uh, extreme focus lens or the pinhole lens as well as an option um, that could be used. I felt this was going to be less involved by reopening the bag. And, uh, and now we have it there. Now it's important that we don't put the prosthesis in the sulcus. Mm -hmm. This is meant to go in the capsular bag. And so this, uh, this would not result in, uh, in causing UGG syndrome or pigment dispersion, but you can see the difference here. Now there is one that goes into the, into the sulcus, the 96C, but the, the, the issue with that one is it, it can move. So uh, yes. getting that at the proper position is not always easy to, uh, 
to get it to stay where you want it to be. Yes, thank you, George. Yeah, there are some specifically designed for it. Most of these are not designed for the stalkers, but you're right, the 916, George had a nice, had a nice case last year he did with it. Uh, and they could potentially rotate, although I think your case went, went very well. Uh, that can go to the sulcus. I do worry about these implants in the sulcus, mind you, and there's a, there's a risk, of, of course, for pigment dispersion if they go in the sulcus. Okay, uh, let's talk about glistings. Uh, what do you guys think of this? Can, can, can this cause problems with dysphotopsia? What do you think, participants, panelists, I should say? So I, 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 I've been reviewing this recently and uh, the, the, the glistenings, uh, there's not a lot of studies that have shown uh, that glistenings, especially at a mi mild to moderate stage, have a significant impact on the MTF and the different uh, contrast sensitivity curves in patients. Now, if it's a significant amount of glistenings, and this is graded as per the amount of, uh, of uh, these vacuoles that you see within the lens, are really significant, like over 500 per millimeter square, then you can have some visually significant uh, decreased contrast. But it's again, it's hard for patients to, to recognize this because typically it's a slow growing process until it stabilizes at some point, but it can take many years for this to develop. Uh, and it's typically in both eyes. So then they're not really sure how they can, how you can really differentiate from this being due to the glistenings or other causes in general. Yeah, you know, in the like these generally no, I guess if they're really dense and confluent and can, but it's the sometimes the the calcifications in the hydrophilic lenses after air or gas, um, or sometimes subsurface nanoglistenings that'll cause more visually significant issues. I think you said it very well, um, and I think you know the stromal glistenings. I, I I don't say I don't I wouldn't say I love them. I don't necessarily like them. But in my readings, in my experience, I don't think they typically cause visual pro problems or phenomena. Uh, I would say that they can progress, and I and I do, and I will say that um, that you know maybe there's some unknowns here, but different, differentiating forward from backscatter. But I think I would just say that it's a bit controversial how much it does cause. And and yes, someone made a comment that listings have reduced because of manufacturing changes in 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 in, the, in these lenses, um, but they still seem to be present in some ways. And I think some of the new, new generation material. Uh, seems to reduce the level of listings. But there's a difference between that and this. I'm not sure how well this is projecting on your screen, but any of the panelists, can you see what's going on in this case here? I think it's what what, what you were talking about, Arsham. Yeah, yeah. So like, it, it, it was, is this a hydrophilic lens? Uh, yes, hydrophilic yeah. acrylic, yes. Yeah, I mean, like, it's hard to tell the detail, but but yeah, if, if you start getting sometimes... I mean, there's some areas of almost that intra lenticular like calcification, these little dots, but the, just the rest of that haze. Do you have another, uh, do you have a picture of more of like a slit beam of it or maybe not? I don't, but, uh, but let me see if I have it. Yeah, this, this, these are all, these are all similar. Yeah. These are similar examples here. It's almost like, like it'll, if you look at it like this, you'll say, Hey, that looks like PCO. And if you look more carefully, that opacity is in the IOL and it's more confluent. Um, and, and those are the ones that, that have more issues, but typically like you'll get a history of, for one, it's more of a hydrophilic IOL issue. They might've had a desec with air. They might've had retinal surgery, even with air or gas. Um, and even patients like uveitis over time, they can end up with some of these opacities and, and these, yes, exactly. That can be visually significant. There you go. That's a good one. Yeah, it's important to differentiate subsurface nanoglistings from the typical stromal glistings. You know, yeah. the stromal glistings as we showed, talked about earlier, are pretty common. And in fact, most lenses have some glistings and some more than others. Uh, however, this stuff where you actually see this surface whitening of the lens and it can be confluent or it can be map-like, you know, here, for example, again, uh, this basically looks like calcification. It's a little different in terms of the pathology here, but basically this uh, essentially is quite symptomatic and quite problematic. And these are again, lens-based. And, and a more extreme example would be, uh, this is actually, um, this, actually yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is a slip beam here, I think, Arsham, yeah. for you. Yeah, exactly. See, cause like what, what I'm trying to identify, sometimes you'll get patients that might've had a prolonged inflammation and they'll get just a very fine layer of fibrin that deposits over the top. And that I think you can try to do just a very light anterior gag, see if you can blow off the material. But if it really truly looks like it's lenticular in the lens, um, this would be visually significant. 
we, we often see patients that have have this and then they complain of problems like blurred vision or glare and they have a capsulotomy done, which is unfortunate because you know now it makes the eye well exchange more difficult. So be very mindful. These typically happen years later, mind you. So don't just go to the obvious. If you see the capsule is opacified, look at the lens, check the lens, make sure the lens is not problematic. And this is a high, this is a hydrophobic IOL. And what's, what's the diagnosis here? Yeah. So those are calcifications of, uh, I feel of the IOL itself there. Acrius there. Uh -huh. no. Acrius lens. Yeah. So yeah, this is a hydrophobic hydrophilic, sorry, hydrophilic oh, lens. Hydro yeah. And, uh, and so this, uh, this is a phenomenon that, and I should, I should have mentioned earlier this, 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 the, uh, the nano glistings here have been reported in, in hydrophobic lenses. Um, but these opacifications like this calcifications are, are more commonly found in hydrophilic lenses, hydrophilic lenses, I should mention there. So, so yes, I mean, these are, these are, these are can present in similar ways, although, uh, the mechanism is maybe a little bit different than the pathology, a little bit different. I'll see what you guys think of this. The these that you're showing here with the the calcifications, generally you'll see like a line or two drop in visual acuity if it's long enough, and then the subsurface nano glistenings, the visual acuity might be the same, but their complaints are more. Would you guys agree with that? Yes, yes. I would agree. I would agree. And of course, the the answer for these are and, and just one more thing. Look at the scatter on this. Look at the ocular scatter. I mean, it's um, it's 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 off the maps. Yeah. So. Sometimes, though, even subtle amount of, uh, of nano glistenings or whitening of the lens or calcification of the lens can cause a lot of glare, even with a 2030 vision. So one has to be kind of mindful of that and be aware of that. I should mention, of course, that these patients typically require IOL exchange, and I won't go into that, uh, but it is something that we have to be, uh, be aware of. Um, I just want to go back to a couple of questions that came up before, which was uh, in relation to the capsule stria uh, case that we discussed. And I think someone had asked about a CTR and using a CTR in a case like this, would it be something that you would, would, would you use to avoid it? Do you go back in and do it? I mean, what, what are your thoughts about using a CTR to avoid stria? I think it's pretty hard to predict like who's going to get these very linear striae unless you had an area of zonal disinsertion, then a CTR might help. But I, I don't know about you guys. I haven't been able to predict when they get this. And in my mind, I wouldn't take them back to the OR to put a CTR in because the YAC capsulotomy is um, so beneficial. So I, I've been noticing these sometimes at the end of my cases. And when I see them, I, I try to blow up the bag and try to avoid that happening at the very end and try to keep the pressure high. I don't know if it really helps. I don't know if they stay and if they, they reappear afterwards, but I tend to try to avoid leaving the OR with those stria in the back. So I, I try to make sure that I flatten them as much as I can. George, I've noticed it quite often as well too. And a lot of times we were told actually in residency that if you notice that, that means you've removed all the viscote and provisco behind the bag. So it's actually a good sign. Um, and whether I fill up the eye or not, sometimes I've just done it like anecdotally to see if it helps. And a lot of times it goes away by, its own, like by itself. And Ike, was this a three piece in the sulcus or is it in the bag? This was, this was in the bag. In the bag, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I think it's hard to really predict it. And I mean, you know, so much of it's based on the pressure in the eye and the OVD and uh, how much you've inflated the capsule. Um, if, of course, you could try rotating the lens to see whether it reduces in a certain axis if you want to. Uh, the bag is typically longer in the vertical than the horizontal axis. So you could argue maybe it might be more advantageous to put a lens in the vertical axis just to put less tension on there. I, I don't know. You could argue either way on that one, actually, depending on how you want to look at it. So, um, and I think three piece lenses probably are more likely to cause it than one piece. But the nice thing is I think most of the time they don't cause a problem. It's rare to cause a problem and they can be readily easily treated with a capsulotomy. Although there might be increased risk of PCO because of the ability for cells to migrate along those, along those axes. Okay, so we've talked a lot about, uh, a lot about uh, positive Thanks. dysphotopsia in different ways. Of course, I mean, we haven't talked about multifocal lenses but that should be an obvious one in terms of what can happen. We already know this and they can certainly present in different ways. This is an example of, of different descriptions. Uh, the one on the left versus the right. The one on the left is what we often talk about when we talk about a classic multifocal lens. On the right is kind of a spider web phenomena, which in, people have described more with EDOF lenses, like the symphony lens versus the trifocal lens. And we can debate which is worse, which one, which one causes more. But regardless of that, they can. And when they do become a problem, then they have to be treated 
if it's debilitating. Often, of course, they get adapted to them. I'm not going to get into detail about that. But before I finish the, um, the, the, uh, the issues here, I want to make sure we just talk about negative dysphotopsia because we talked about positive, but negative dysphotopsia um, is probably a more common phenomenon that we see that can be quite bothersome. And this is just a patient of mine. I'm just going to play it with his permission. Okay, um, Raymond, tell me you had surgery in January and February of this year. When did your symptoms first start? Within a day, I noticed uh, a pronounced arcing of gray arcs. Okay. So it does it feel like I'm wearing rings around, every, I feel like I have rings around my eyes, on the outside of the eyes. You described the binocular, if you can maybe use like that. Like binoculars, so it's like wearing binoculars that uh, as I, my eyes turn. So as you can as you can probably gather, this is this he's describing classic negative dysphotopsia, uh, which has been described now in the literature and is a bit of a conundrum in the sense of perhaps explaining it. But to me, certainly it is uh, more IOL related and positioning of the lens in the eye, where you have light refracted uh, and then around the lens, but yet light then is basically blocked by the edge of the lens, and that costs a shadow. Um, and I guess the question is, why does it occur in, in certain cases and why does it occur temporally? Well, there's a few reasons why that, that are postulated. And I think Jack Holliday, I think has, you know, the best paper out there. And I think I'd recommend folks to read it. And as you see here, it, uh, it, it does depend on the incidence of light in terms of where it strikes the lens. And there's an area of where the, where the light rays, uh, basically, uh, cast a shadow on the peripheral retina and the temp in the extreme temporal field. This is more prominent in a small pupil, a larger angle kappa, um, and a lens that basically is sitting uh, within a certain, certain distance of the iris. And so there's a certain distance, whether it's too close, whether it's, if it's, if it's sitting right behind the iris, you're okay. If it's sitting way back from the iris, you're okay. But there's a certain range where it is. Uh, and, you know, IOL edge design and material may play a role as well. So the, these, are, these, are, these are explanations I think that to me probably make the most sense. And you can argue, why does it happen more so nasally? Sorry, temporal? It's because the phenomenon is happening on the nasal iris, the, the nasal retina. The nasal retina, remember the aura serrata uh, inserts more anteriorly on the nasal side than the temporal side. So as an example here, you can see the ciliary body. Let me just put my, just put my marker here. The ciliary, this is the, this is the, this is the ciliary processes here, the zonules here, uh, the, the pars plana, and this is the aura. This uh, the pars plana is longer temporal than it is nasally, and so the retina insertion is more anterior nasally, and that's one explanation why folks argue that this is why maybe we have more of a phenomena in the temporal visual field, which is the nasal retina. If you can if you can follow me in on that one. And some work done many, many years ago, I think really kind of shows it nicely on histopath that the, um, that, you know, compared to the equator of the lens uh, of the eye, I should say, uh, the, uh, the, the nasal retina is more anterior in position than the temporal side. And therefore, if a shadow is cast on the nasal retina resulting in a temporal shadow, it's more likely to occur than on the temporal retina, which is nasal. The other reason as well that, that people that we talk about is the fact that we do have protection of light coming in tangentially from the, from the bridge of the, uh, the, the nasal bridge as well as the orbital bones, while temporally we're more exposed. Uh, and so uh, those are also reasons why these occur. So when you do have a patient like this that does have, um, that does have um, negative dysphotopsia, uh, like the patient we just described, let me take a poll and see what the audience would do in terms of their preferred uh, option for treating it. Now, again, these phenomena typically get better over time. We don't recommend that we rush in and treat these patients. But let's say the patient now is quite bothered several months later, you know, a year later now, and it's really problematic. Um, what are the options here? And maybe as, as the group is answering, I'll, I'll go back to our panelists in terms of how you would typically treat these patients, assuming again, they've consented for surgeries, bothering them, and you waited because obviously observation is is key early on. I think this de depends on where you've been trained. <laughs> if you talk to Sam Maskett, he's probably going to say reverse optic capture these and you'll be fine. And it works in ninety. I forget his paper. How much percentage it worked in? 
Um, I think I think UI have more experience with the exchanging these, and this is kind of my uh, very biased uh, opinion about this is, is to remove it and put it in a three piece. And in this case, place it in the sulcus because you're pushing it more anteriorly. Uh, so yes, yes, yeah. I talked about I, uh, reverse optic capturing, and look at how many people voted for that. So, um, but yeah, I, I feel that if you really want to have the best chance of really taking care of this permanently, it's to um, remove the lens, put it in a three piece in the sulcus with a round edge design, ideally a different IOL material. Uh, there was a silicone three piece lens that was available previously, but that, that isn't anymore. Uh, so um, I think that using a three piece lens in the sulcus is a good uh, alternative. Yeah, I mean, like you're looking at what's the refractive state um, that'll sometimes guide you toward IOL exchange, especially if they're maybe a little off target. And the the silicone lenses are pretty decent options, but the columnar lens by star, it's got pretty low surface reflectivity. So your positive symptoms are less likely there as well. And it's a little bit more stable in the in the sulcus space. But I think that's been the most definitive. You'll look, um, yeah, capsulotomy is done on the anterior capsule. Even in that paper, it was like a 50% rate of improvement. The reverse optic capture, I personally have not had the best experience with. I think the most definitive is uh, doing something with the original IOL and, and generally that's removal. I'm not a huge piggyback fan as far as putting then a, uh, like a neutral lens in the sulcus space over the top, but that's another option. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna hear, you're gonna hear different, uh, different uh, ways to do these things. And I think uh, people have different experiences. I, I think, you know, uh, I looked at people like Sam Maskett and Nicole Fram who've uh, done a lot of good work on this. And I think they've uh, really uh, advanced the field and I think provided some really good uh, options. Uh, I like Jack Holliday's paper as well. As I mentioned, I would recommend you reading all those. I can just talk about our personal experience and we've tried all these. You can see that there were some that were advocating laser in the anterior capsule and, and, and you know, this has been done and yet we still see this phenomenon that can occur. Um, I generally avoid this because of course it does potentially make the next step more difficult if it doesn't work. And in my experience, uh, I have had the highest success in, you know, in I think our series is well over 100 cases of uh, exchanging the lens for a sulcus lens. Um, of course, what sulcus lens do you use? Uh, I do, I, I used to love the star lens, the AQ series, but that's, uh, they no longer uh, make that lens. Um, I think I typically use uh, a rounded anterior as like the Sensar AR40 lens in the sulcus typically. Uh, silicone like lenses can be used as well. LI lenses. Sorry, Arsham. The, the LI lenses. Exactly. The LI sixty one. LI sixty one U. I think is a, is a good option as well. So, you know, I think you can choose. You can choose either of those. Either of those options. Um, I would say that reverse optic capture has been successful in many many cases, but we just had a few that didn't, and I think that's just one reason why we've been a little bit more. So I tell I tell my patients, say, listen, I can do a reverse optic capture, um, which uh, which. Is, is a possibility. Uh, we could do a, a piggyback lens, which is a possibility. Both those things have been reported to be successful, although not always, but those are less, I guess, invasive. Um, or we do an exchange, which I think in my hands is more, uh, is more uh, successful. And Nicole's, I see Nicole's here. We, should, we, have to actually, we actually have to bring Nicole here. I didn't realize Nicole's on this call, but she's, she's a world wizard with all this stuff. So I'm gonna actually promote you to panelists, Nicole, so you can make some comments on this when you get on here. And I think you make a good point that if you do put a lens in the sulcus, consider suturing it, especially if the eye is big or the sulcus space is large because uh, an eye well in the sulcus could move or not be well positioned. And I do agree that is something that is done. Although I don't do it routinely, honestly, Nicole, I maybe I guess you get your input. When I do put a sulcus lens, not like this case here, but a, a straight eye well exchange, um, I typically don't accept that the patient's like a higher myope or I feel that the lens isn't centering well during the surgery. So Nicole, I think you're, I think I may have unmuted you. Uh, if you're, I don't know if you're here. Um, I'm on the call with Sam. Hey, Maskin. Nicole. Nice. Hi. Nice um, to hear I'm from on... you. Good. You should also add Sam because he's on the the is webinar Sam also. Too? Well, no one told me Sam is here. Yeah, get him on. Oh come on! How can we do this without Sam? I don't. I don't see his name on the list though. Oh no. Maybe he's on. Maybe he's got a. Maybe he's got like a pseudonym or something, like Lady Gaga or something. <laughs> well, um. That, you know, I think you bring up some great points. Uh, one of the things that I learned from Sam is that if you're going to put an IOL in the sulcus secondarily, uh, we often will do just kind of light iris suture fixation um, so that it doesn't move over time because we've all seen 
uh, three-piece IOLs in the sulcus that have kind of drifted over time, depending on the zonular integrity and the fibrosis of the capsule. I think that's a great pearl. I, ha I have to admit, I don't do it routinely. I haven't done it routinely, but I have a couple of cases where I didn't do it, where they didn't, didn't have negative sotopsy, but exactly like you said, the lens was decentered and they had another phenomena, which is basically more of a peripheral arc and a positive dysphotopsia and issues around that. So I think it's a very good idea. It's interesting to do it routinely and maybe you have to consider on, oh, Sam is here. Let me, let me we gotta get Sam here. For some reason I couldn't find you. Oh, there we are, okay. Sam is here. Well, we have to stop everything here to get Sam on board here. <laughs> you got, you, we got some ringers here. We didn't know, we didn't know they're here. Can I just add, if you've had this on your first eye, um, just some people will say like, oh, well, would, you, would you take the chance for the second eye? And I wouldn't, I, if, you know, if it's happening one eye negative dysphotopsia, I wouldn't just put another uh, one piece IOL in the bag for the other eye. So what do you do, Dima? If you have someone who's got negative dysphotopsia in the first eye and you've managed it, whatever way you manage it, what do you do for a second eye? So then I would still, I would do a three piece. Uh, uh, so I, either I would do reverse optic capture, which I've done, or a three piece uh, in the sulcus. Okay. All right, Sam, you are on my friend. How much time do you need? I don't know where to start. It's great to see. You. <laughs> <laughs> don't, I, we didn't I really, talk about the anterior capsule too much. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think you're covering the, the subject well. I, I think the whole that there's a big differentiation though, and that is that positive dysotopsy, and I don't mean related to ocular surface disease or capsule issues. I'm talking about lens induced, is really a design phenomenon. It's what is that, how is that lens made? I'm glad you showed the non-optic portion uh, or lenticular design back in the PD case, because that is definitely a source and that particular lens style is associated with a higher incidence of PD. But PD is really, really an edge disease. Um, yes, we can help it by reducing the um, uh, index of refraction, but it's basically uh, an edge design phenomenon. And we demonstrated that back in, in 93, when we looked at the greater incidence of PD symptoms in patients with oval lenses, the truncated oval lenses. We didn't call it PD, we called it undesired optical phenomena. On the other hand, I think ND is really position of the lens. Um, this, this shadow that is cast on the, na on the uh, anterior nasal retina doesn't really seem to be um, edge design phenomenon. Uh, and that paper we published with, that I published with Nicole um, January of uh, 18, um, we had uh, 40 eyes that required exchange for ND. And in that study, 13% um, of the lenses had round, they were round silicone edge IOLs. So it, it's not, uh, it doesn't seem to be index of refraction, doesn't seem to be edge design, it seems to be position. So the big differentiation between ND and PD is, is it material and design versus position of the lens? And if you think of it in those terms, I think it's, it simplifies it a lot. You know, thanks, Sam. I think those, those are wise words, and I, I, I probably would guess that it's probably multifactorial in many ways, but position is the, is the number one uh, factor. Um, and I know that you've worked on uh, designs and, and, and modifications to, 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 to hopefully uh, resolve this. Unfortunately, the, I guess the market is necessarily, not necessarily big enough for this, but we do need to, 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 uh, to address this. And unfortunately, our designs and our current IOL options don't allow, this, allow for this. So thank you for, for your contributions. I'm just curious, Sam, since you have it on the call, what, what, is, what has been your preference for, uh, sorry, for, um, for choices like this when you have a patient who is complaining of negative sotopsia? What, do you, what is your first step typically for, for treating this, assuming the patient wants it treated? Okay, well, the most important thing is to make the patient know they're not crazy, to explain it to them in the best terms we can. Uh, the biggest problem we have with ND is that almost invariably, it's in perfect surgery. Mm -hmm. ND tends not to occur if you've got a decentered, tilted, or what have you, IOL. You really have to have a well-centered, uh, capsule overlapped IOL. And so here the surgeon thinks he or she's done an excellent job and the patient's symptomatic. Um, so uh, you have to let them know that there's a discrepancy between what we think is the best for them and how some of them react. And also that uh, the great majority will get better over time. 
Uh, ND, the latest paper on incidents, it's as high as 20% in the early post-op period, cuts down about 3% at a year, 2% at two years. And that's from Bobby Osher's work. So I let them know there's nothing wrong. I let them know that most often they're going to get better. There are some non-surgical means that can help them. Um, you know, it's back to the conversation about why they note it on the, uh, on the temporal side. A lot has to do with anatomy. Um, but if you block temporal light, you'll improve symptoms. Now, I don't know how much time you have, and I will send you a paper that we published in the January uh, 20 issue, where we've now learned that if you block temporal light in the fellow eye, the symptoms improve. So we've used opaque, peripherally opaque contact lenses on the fellow eye, or you can occlude the fellow eye and the symptoms improve in 80% of the patients. And that brings the central nervous system into play. So in terms of helping the patient in the early post-op period, uh, thick temple piece eyeglasses, even peripherally opaque contact lenses can buy you time and help the neuro adapt. Once they get beyond three to six months, though, they're, they're unlikely um, to improve. Now, the experience that Nicole and I ha have had is, is much more positive with um, reverse optic capture, but you may not always be able to do it based upon uh, the nature of the capsule, the nature of the IOL, and what have you. And in that situation, probably sulcus is the best option. Um, I do not like acrylic lenses in the sulcus if I can avoid it. I'd prefer to go either the silicone route or the columnar route. And then as Nicole mentioned, uh, I think it's important to tack uh, with uh, modest tension um, uh, iris uh, suturing um, so that those lenses don't decenter. You know, with it being a lens position issue, um, so we've had problems like getting like some of the Zeiss lenses in. Um, we've even gone to like a Technus three piece of the Alcon three piece in the sulcus, and it seems to do almost just as well. If they have the positive symptoms at the same time as the negative, then I do think the, the silicone is probably your best bet. What do you guys think? Well, if you're asking me, um, yeah, sometimes you have patients have both phenomena. And then you have to change IOL material. You want to go to a lower index of refraction, hence lower surface reflectivity, as you mentioned earlier with regard uh, to the columnar IOL. Um, but I, I've seen cases where you take a, um, uh, a lens out of the bag, you exchange it for a three-piece acrylic lens in the sulcus, and then the patients have PD. Yeah, and, and I wonder whether centration could be an issue for those. And I, I think I think I think silicone is a great material. I, I have had success with both in the sulcus. And I think it's a good point you make that I think it's a consideration to suture or not, as Nicole mentioned earlier. And, and I just want to make one point though, as far as location. I mean, I think we all I think we all agree that I think location and positioning is important, but the actual phenomena of why we see a negative shadow, like the actual optical phenomena. It is, I think we have to argue, and, and I, I think you probably would be interested to hear your comments, Sam, is from the a shadow cast from the lens, right? It is, it is the edge of the lens casting a shadow. Would you would you agree with that statement? Not to pin well, you down. Well, you know, it, <laughs> not necessarily that it's the edge of the lens. I think that the best current theory uh, you've seen from Jay Erie, uh, Michael, uh, Michael Simpson, and, yeah. and Jack, I think, is on board with that, is that you have light that misses, you know, you've got light anterior to the optic, then you have light that gets refracted by, and then you've got light that's actually blocked by the optic. And I think it's that discrepancy right now that is probably the theory that most people ascribe to. The problem with that is that um, theoretically then, a thicker lens would have a greater incidence of ND, and we know that's clearly not the case but it's the best explanation we currently have. Mm -hmm. So, and I think we've heard, we've heard from, from the group here that uh, reverse optic capture is an option. And this is typically um, uh, in, o, in OR uh, phenomena, although, you know, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the access problem, sometimes we have in the OR, if you're able to, this can be done at the silt lamp. I, I think this is the way you do it, Sam. Uh, we're basically 30 gauge needles brought into the AC and we basically lift the lens up above the optic edge, the capsule edge, bringing it forward uh, to now trap it uh, in the sulcus. But of course, that's not usually the way we do it. Uh, and this is actually a video, I think, from Arsham, where patients had a previous capsulotomy, 
uh, and here using a pair of micro forceps to just lift off the capsule from the IOL edge and bring it forward. Th this is somewhat dependent, of course, on the, uh, on the capsulotomy size, the IOL design. Uh, this can be done with, three, with, with one piece lenses. However, if the capsulotomy size is small, uh, there tends to be a twisting of the, of the haptic, which can sometimes malposition the lens uh, or tilt the lens. So three piece lenses are certainly easier to optic capture than one pieces, but one piece is certainly not impossible. Of course, if the capsule axis is not well centered or too large or too small uh, or, or too brittle, sometimes it can be difficult. This also depends a bit on the capsule elasticity, which can vary between patients. But again, in most cases, I think it goes well. And a couple of hooks can be done just to lift it up. What, one word of caution is that the haptics are positioned at three and nine, meaning nasally and temporally, at least the haptic optic junctions are. I do like to rotate the lens to ensure that the entire optic is brought forward. Because if the haptic optic junction is still behind the capsule nasally, then uh, I've seen where the, where the problem may still persist in some form or fashion. So uh, I, that's something that I typically can have. Can you guys comment? Because you know, there's a, a paper in JCRS with Bonnie as far as the uh, haptic positioning and the incidence of, of negative dysphotopsia. Um, do you think that has a lot of merit in your mind? Well, I have my opinion on this. I'm curious what the, what the rest of our group thinks. I don't want to bias uh, anybody. But so so just, just to review the paper, the paper was suggestive, at least the commentary was that placing the haptics at three and nine. Yeah, uh, so it was a, a randomized study looking at placement uh, of the haptic at three and nine versus six and 12. And at around, I think the first month, uh, patients that had haptics placed at three and nine had less negative dysphotopsia, but then after a month or whatever, the rates were the same. But um, they also suggested that maybe we should place them at uh, at three and nine. I, I mean, just looking at the data, even of the paper, I don't think it holds holds very very true. Yeah, and even the data, I think, for some time point showed that it was higher when the when the lenses were positioned at three and nine, if I recall yeah. the paper itself. So I, I I'm not overly convinced of that myself. I don't know what others think. Where Sam or Nicole want to chime in on that one? But I I tend to put my lenses in that position anyways, in general, from mm -hmm. my, early in my career. But <clears throat> I'm not sure whether it actually reduces. <laughs> incidents yeah. well, well certainly once you get into toric lenses that conversation yeah. is moot yeah. number one yeah. uh number two uh <laughs> interestingly i think you have to look at the phenomenon between chronic nd and early onset nd and again because the neuroadaptation um many cases early will go away but it just seems to me and i'm sure nicole will bear me out on this and that is that the people who are referred in with chronic nd we see just as many of those horizontally oriented as we do vertically. So I, I won't argue that there's benefit in reducing early incidence. And if you've got a, you know, a single piece of acrylic and it's a non-toric and you can position to three and nine, I don't see an argument against doing that, but I don't think it helps us with the chronic NV patients. Yeah. There's a comment that came from the, from the chat group about uh, oval lenses, lens, the lens tech oval lens. I, I don't have experience with that, but do you have any comments on, on that particular lens design? Well, in our original 40 paper, 40 I paper, two of them uh, were of that design. Um, they had combined ND and PD. The thick truncated edge of an oval lens is a real source for positive dysphotopsia. So I am not enamored with it. Okay, great. So I think we will uh, we will we will find we will come to our conclusions here. It's been a really great discussion, and we had a couple of really nice guest guest uh, uh, panelists as well. I do want to thank uh, all of you that have been uh, been here. Of course, this is what we want to get. We want to get that happy patient. I think recognizing this autopsy, I think, has been has been you know what would be the most important thing, as, as Sam has mentioned. Um, you know, to recognize it and the patients are not themselves crazy. I, I think some of the big, biggest challenges I've, I've had the patients have been referred is that they felt that they've been ignored and, and not taken seriously. And I think that's unwind, unpacking that, unwinding that is almost as hard as actually doing the surgery. So I think, you know, thanks to folks like Sam and Nicole and others, I, I think the word has gotten out that these phenomena occur. And in fact, I always make sure my informed consent with every patient that I do that is part of that informed consent. Just like I would talk about an infection risk or retinal attachment risk, uh, I don't use the word just photopsia. I use the word unwanted uh, shadows or glare from a lens because we're using a human-made lens and God made the perfect lens. Uh, and we don't have that perfect lens necessarily right now. 
until the mascot lens comes out. When's the mascot lens coming out? <laughs> you know, uh, it's going to be released in Europe this year. Um, uh, getting to Canada may be easier than in the U.S. Uh, you know, it's made by Mortra, and Mortra doesn't have the very, very best FDA relationship. So yeah. we'll see. But it, it, it's out there. Well, uh, I want to just uh, maybe, uh, again, thank everybody for being part of this discussion. We had a great glaucoma case. We had uh, a lot of discussion on Iowa dysphotopsia. We were, uh, had, had great panelists with Vanessa and Dima, George and Arsham. Thank you for being part of that. Uh, bonus, bonus round here to get Sam and Nicole on, uh, which, is, which is wonderful to have Good them. Sanjay, man. Here. Sanjay. And San, where's that? I was looking for Sanjay for some comments on dysphotopsia, but I mean, to have, to have Sanjay here as part of our discussion on glaucoma was wonderful. So this is, this is the beauty about doing these webinars, um, doing, having this forum to do this, and I guess having the time to do this. Normally, most of us would be running around seeing patients and operating. And so, uh, you know, it's been, it's been a great experience doing this. I hope that uh, we continue this post-COVID uh, post in some form or fashion. Um, we have gone over, so I will, I will uh, conclude the, uh, the webinar. I want to thank Jeb, of course, for, for organizing this. We have uh, our next webinar, which is on Wednesday, which is, uh, again, glaucoma focus, and also a, a discussion, and hopefully it'll be a live discussion about how do we stay sharp uh, not operating or not operating much during, uh, during COVID, um, during the COVID crisis here. And we'll have a bunch of folks uh, who can share some of their thoughts about how, what they're doing, including, uh, I'm hoping, I'm hoping Nicole will join us. I mean, I have, I don't know if we've actually, actually asked her yet. Have we asked her yet, Jeb? Email's coming up. Email's coming up. Okay. So Nicole, you're going to be a regular here, but, uh, I know Nicole has done a lot of good work with artificial eyes. And I think this is a good way to, to learn as well, uh, during this time off. So thanks. I, I actually don't want to say I don't want to say bye because I mean having this group, great group of people in front of me here. I mean I'd, I'd have you with me all day. I mean Sam, it looks it looks really bright where you are. Well, I'll move. That that's an outdoor, <laughs> no, that's no, a window. It keep it there. Well, I, I need some sun. I need some sun uh -oh. here. Hey, it's L.A., my man. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to want to have any parting parting thoughts? Uh, I mean, we still have about two hundred people that are still on, and we had about I don't know almost a thousand people on YouTube. So we had a lot of people that were on. Uh, and a lot of people still watching, so pretty amazing to see everybody. Um, Vanessa, what are you? What, any comments from you? Oh man, it's Saturday. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> you can leave. You can leave. We, I, it, it, we got, we got, we got a great group of people here. I feel like I don't want to leave you guys. It, it, it's not Saturday. It's yesterday, today, or tomorrow. That's it. They're all the same. <laughs> I, I will say I've had a lot, a lot of, a lot of negative comments about my hair today. Apparently, it's really flat today, so I apologize. Uh, I'll, I'll put a hat on here, so uh, that way it's maybe a bit better. Just for all you folks who are wondering again, you know, it's, we're the current reigning champions here, the Raptors. So, <laughs> sorry, sorry about LA and uh, yeah. Golden State. Uh, Dima, any, any last parting words from you? No, I was just going to say next time, do we need to bring uh, scissors? Or are you going to teach us how to use uh, uh, scissors to cut our own hair? Well, are you complaining about Sam's hair? Sam, your hair does look pretty long. <laughs> it is there. <laughs> that's a great That's a great head of hair, man. Sam, I got to give you that, man. Let's uh, forget this autopsia. It's my oh, Sephardic great grandmother. <laughs> These are great uh, webinars, Like, Thank you for doing them. And Jeb, thank you for organizing them. Well, thank you, Dima. You've been part of a lot of them. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Shivani, you look like you're in a club. You're in a club right now. Yeah, but it's pretty empty now with COVID, man. It's it's, it's rough go. A lot of ones, no one to no one to give them to. <laughs> okay, George. Yeah, no, this has been great. Thanks to Ike and, and Jeb to putting this together. It's been a great talk. Thanks, guys. Enjoyed it, Nir. Thank you for putting together that that really interesting case. I always love when cases get uh, discussion and controversy. That's what we want. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. I appreciate I appreciate the opportunity to present. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And we have uh, Nicole. I think you're still here. We can't see you though. Yeah, that's probably better that way. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to say uh, thanks for letting us crash the party. I think you guys did a great job today. No, you guys are. You guys are. It's a privilege to have you here. I mean, we've learned so much from uh, from both of you. You and Sam, and you guys are our power. So thank you for being part of that. And I hope you will join us again, Nicole. We do want to tap into you. And Sam, you're always welcome to crash. If you do, let, let us let me know early on so I can bring you in. I would have asked you about the glaucoma OCTs and those optic nerves. <laughs> Red disease. Red disease. Red disease. See, he's got it, man. He's got it down. He's got it down. 
I, actually, Sam, while, while you're here, we, we are yes. putting together actually next weekend uh, a group of international surgeons to talk about difficult cases and how they approach it. We'd love to have you part of that. Maybe we can email you afterwards and, and have you join it. Maybe you can present a case. It's sure. basically just an international group of surgeons presenting interesting cases, and we're all going to talk about them. So Happy to. I'm going to count you in on that one. So, so Jeb, if you can... I'll get in touch with you, uh, Dr. Maskett. Okay, sure. Thanks. Yeah, Dr. Happy Maskett. To. Really happy to. Ike, Ike, this is great stuff. Really great stuff. Well, you've inspired uh, us, Sam. We, we, we are, we're, we're amongst a, a legend here. Uh, and so um, we, we, we appreciate your presence here. And thank you to everybody. You guys have been fantastic to, to work together and to join. The, I look forward to these sessions all the time. And, um, and I do pray for everyone's safety. Uh, we're going to get over this. We're going to get stronger from this and, uh, and learn from this and uh, take the time to spend time with your families and to, uh, to uh, you know, be safe and, um, and continue to, the learning process and continue to advance knowledge, which is what this is all about. So thanks, everybody, again. We'll see you again Wednesday at 3 o'clock for our next session and then next Saturday at 12. And we thank all the international um, attendees who have, who have come on board here and uh, spread the word. Take care. Love everybody. Peace. Bye. Bye. Peace.